Ladies and gentlemen, can I have your attention, please? Man, you guys are obedient. <laughs> well, welcome to the patient-led drug development meeting for epidermolysis bullosa and pachynechia, pachynechia congenita. I should know how to say that since I have it. Commonly referred to as EB and PC. Welcome to the FDA officials. To have you here ready to listen to our voices means the world to us. Welcome to our scientists, clinicians, and industry friends. Welcome to the caregivers and loved ones of patients. Welcome to all the patients here who suffer from EB and PC. Many of you are in pain right this minute. Thank you for coming to share what is for many of you, private, personal, and maybe even a little embarrassing. And finally, to those who are watching this broadcast live through our webcast, hello, and thank you for joining us wherever in the world you are. Because if you're watching this live through the broadcast, you are just as much a part of this meeting as anybody sitting in here right now. I am Janice Schwartz, the chair of PC Project, board of trustees, and I'm a PC patient myself. If any of you saw me earlier, you might have seen me standing or standing on crutches, using crutches, or using a wheelchair. And now you see me standing here at this podium like I've been miraculously healed. Well, I am your first live visual aid of this meeting to demonstrate the complexities of rare diseases like EB and PC. Today, I hope you'll gain insights about the people who live courageously with PC and EB. Working in preparation for this meeting with leaders from Deborah of America, Brett Copeland, and Joe Murray, I've gained a greater understanding of those who suffer from the various types of EB and the people who care for them. I've seen the love of Brett and Joe for the EB patients in their dedication to finding treatments for those with EB. I've seen the love firsthand from Holly Evans from PC Project who has worked tirelessly for this meeting. And I've seen that love from PC Project's founder, Mary Schwartz, who began this whole charity of PC Project completely based on her love for others. This I know, as leaders in this organization, every act we take for EB and PC patients is motivated by our love for them. And I just have to tell you, I, it's a little awkward for me to be standing here because I'm a patient myself. Throughout my entire life, I've always seemed to be able to find somebody who has a problem that's worse than mine. And so it's kind of hard for me to stand here and say, please help me, please help my disease, please help my pain, um, when I can always find somebody who has it worse. In fact, right now, I'll just tell you, I'm in a lot of pain standing right here, but I can always say, well, at least I have feet. But I've come to realize that we all have some kind of pain. I would say that every single person in this room, whether they have um, EB or not, or PC or not, has some kind of pain. Physical pain, emotional pain, mental, heartbreak, financial pain. I mean, you name it, there's pain out there. And when we find that somebody has pain and is dealing with hard things, we don't just go, oh, too bad, so sad, you know, just good luck dealing with it. We don't because that's not who we are. We, we take care of one another. And we say, let me try to understand and let me help your burden be a little bit lighter. And I know, especially from the outcome of this meeting and this preparation, that there are many hardworking people who do care. There's enough love to go around. There's enough resources to go around. And... Um, and that's why, even though there's a million different kinds of pain out there, it's okay to now, today is the time to focus on the pain of PC and EB patients. And so you could probably see why we're just incredibly grateful to the FDA. Ah, I'm, I'm emotional already. In this room right here, we have 24 FDA officials in attendance right now. And we have 18 additional FDA officials attending via the live broadcast. So if you are an FDA official in this room, and I don't know who you all are, I'm, I'm, I'm learning some of you, but I want you to know that we from PC Project and Deborah of America are just humbled that you're here, that you're listening to the voices of our patients, and we're just grateful for your interest in facilitating the development of safe and effective treatments for patients suffering from PC and EB. Thank you, thank you for caring enough to be here. And none of us would be here today if it weren't for the vision of Dr. Julie Bites. Dr. Bites has had a 23-year career at the FDA involving both pre- and post-approval regulatory activities. Since 2006, she has served as the director of the Office of Drug Evaluation III. In this capacity, she oversees the review activities of the Division of Dermatology and Dental Products, the Division of Gastroenterology, and the Inborn Errors of Metabolism, and the Division of Bone, Reproductive, and Urology Products. 
Dr. Bites has also served on several working groups involved in the implementation of the new regulatory authorities provided for under the FDA Amendments Act of 2007 as the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research Liaison for FDA's Office of Women's Health and as a member of CEDARS Medical Policy Council and Drug Development Tools Committee. I'm not even sure I'm worthy to be in the same room as Dr. Bites after all that. <laughs> but more importantly, Dr. Bites, for us, is one of the pr people who identified the need to first hear from PC and EB patients in order to help her and her staff better appreciate and understand the needs of us as patients. So we appreciate Dr. Bites, as well as Dr. Kendall Marcus and Dr. Jill Lindstrom, who run the dermatology division, and you'll hear from both of them later on today, too. We're thankful for their partnership in today's meeting. So I just want to say before Dr. Bites comes up again, we are just so incredibly grateful for FDA's commitment to advancing innovation in behalf of EB and PC patients. We're so happy you're here, and we're so happy you're willing to listen to us. So we will now hear from Dr. Bites. Good morning. Can you all hear very well? Okay. All right, so good morning and welcome to today's externally led patient-focused drug development meeting for Pachyonychia congenita and epidermolysis villosa. My name is Julie Bites. I am the director of the Office of Drug Evaluation 3 in CEDAR at FDA. I will try to set the stage for why we are here today, what we can expect to learn, and why these learnings are so important. First, I would like to introduce the Division of Dermatology and Dental Products, one of the divisions in my office. As you've heard, several members of the division are present today, including the director, Dr. Kendall Marcus, and the deputy director, Dr. Jill Lindstrom. You will be hearing from them later in the day. The division regulates drug and biologic products intended for the prevention and treatment of a variety of dermatology and dental conditions as noted here on the slide. Among these are PC and EB and other blistering and keratinizing disorders. PC and EB are just two examples of the more than 7,000 rare diseases affecting Americans today. Over 80% of rare diseases are, con are genetic, clinically progressive, and life-limiting. Only 5% have an approved treatment. However, continued advocacy from patients and research institutions has and will continue to foster drug development for these diseases. Why does patient input matter? First, patients may place different values to drug risks and benefits as compared to their health care providers, to their family members, and to drug regulators. In addition, patients themselves may have different perspectives on drug benefits and risks. Some may be willing to accept greater risk to achieve a small benefit, whereas others may be risk averse, requiring more benefit before accepting certain risks. Patient preferences may be influenced by a number of factors, including age, personal values, disease stage, and prior disease management. As people living with a disease, you can provide unique perspectives. We are here today to learn about the symptoms, the complications, the frustrations, and the impacts of PC and EB on your daily lives, both in the short and longer term. We want to hear about how your disease is currently managed, what works for you, and what doesn't work for you. We want to hear your views on risk tolerance, given that drugs have both benefits and risks. If presented with a new drug treatment option, how much risk would be acceptable to you? I would also like to point out that even when there are drugs approved for a disease, there may still be many unmet needs. I've listed a couple here. There may be a need for a special or, or particular 
uh, subpopulation of patients that the approved drug doesn't really address. Or there may be a need for a special formulation of the drug. For example, for pediatric patients, we, we may want to have a liquid version of the drug that's already approved. Patient input can be informative both before and after a drug is approved. In the pre-market period, patient input can inform a company's decisions about which drugs or which formulations are developed. Patient input can inform the selection of meaningful efficacy outcomes, we call them endpoints as well, to be used in clinical trials. And what magnitude of change is important? Patients can inform us about the designs of clinical trials by tailoring schedules for clinic visits and the numbers and types of procedures to be performed in a trial. These features of designs are important to ensure participation and retention of patients in the trials. Patients can tell us which risks we should be monitoring in trials and can provide us with an understanding of the level of benefit that would be required in order to accept a certain level of risk. In the post-market post setting, patients can provide us with perspectives on new safety risks should they arise. For example, we would want to know what the acceptability of a new risk might be given what we know about the drug already as far as benefits. Patients can also help facilitate communication about new safety risks. While there have been many opportunities for patient engagement over the years, a more formalized process for obtaining input from patients was initiated in 2013. In that year, Congress enacted what's called the Fifth Reauthorization of PDUFA, or PDUFA-5. PDUFA stands for the Prescription Drug User Fee Act, which was the law passed in 1992 allowing FDA to collect uh, fees from drug manufacturers to fund the new drug review process. In 2013, with PDUFA-5, FDA launched a Patient-Focused Drug Development Initiative, or PFDD Initiative for short. And this allowed us to, or called for us, to convene several public meetings with patients, with caregivers, and patient advocacy groups. A total of 24 meetings were held on a variety of conditions over a five-year period to hear patient perspectives on the burden of their disease and on available treatment options. Looking to the future, patient organizations such as PC Project and Deborah of America can expand on the PFDD initiative in several ways. For example, convening a meeting just like today's. Or they could uh, participate in other FDA meetings and workshops that we convene. They can coordinate with other advocacy groups, and I'm happy to see the coordination between these two groups today. Uh, they can perform communication and outreach they can educate patients about the drug development process in the United States. They can submit what's called proposed guidance to the agency for our consideration. And, and this could include um, information about the disease or how the disease might be impacted by certain drugs, uh, what, what matters most to patients that we should be looking for to try to assess in trials. Or they could take a look at what we've already posted published uh, in terms of guidance and provide comment. Under the sixth reauthorization of PDUFA, which we're now calling PDUFA-6, FDA has committed to developing systematic approaches to collecting patient input so that what we learn can inform future regulatory decisions. Over the next five years, FDA will convene additional public workshops and publish additional guidance. Working together, we can expect to see innovation in a number of areas, in venues for patient engagement such as this, and in the systematic collection of patient preference information. 
innovation in clinical trial designs that incorporate patient preferences, innovation in development strategies for drugs and rare diseases so that every patient counts and every measurement counts, and most importantly, an innovation in approvals of new drugs, new drug combinations, and new drug delivery systems. In closing, I would like to share this portrait of Clara. Clara is a two and a half year old living with EB. Her portrait is part of an art exhibit called Beyond the Diagnosis. This exhibit is traveling around the world to medical schools, hospitals, and even to the FDA campus in Silver Spring, Maryland. Her smile speaks volumes about her spirit to live with and overcome EB. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bites. The PC session of the meeting will now be moderated by James Valentine. James works at the law firm Hyman, Phelps, and Mac. I'm just nervous. <laughs> Mac <Demi> <laughs> Yeah, McNamara, where he assists medical product industry and patient advocacy organization clients in a wide range of regulatory matters. James is considered a leading expert in patient engagement in drug development and approval. Before joining his firm in 2014, James worked in the FDA's Office of Health and Constituent Affairs, where he facilitated patient input in benefit risk decision making and served as a liaison to stakeholders on a wide range of regulatory policy issues. One of the last things James did or worked on before leaving FDA was to help launch the Patient Focused Drug Development or the PFDD program like this. James has aided with seven of ten of those meetings, six of which he has moderated. So he's an expert right here, and we've loved having him lead us and guide us as we prepare for this meeting. And I have personally seen James in action. He, he led a focus group at the PC Patient Support Meeting last summer. James is sharp and he's bright, he's right on point, but I know James genuinely cares not only about the success of these meetings and this meeting, but he also cares about making a difference for PC patients and EB patients. So with that, I'm happy to turn now the rest of the morning session over to James. Thank you, Jan, for that kind introduction, and thank you, Dr. Bites, for those uh, really insightful remarks. Um, it is now my uh, job to uh, get us to work for the day. Uh, we have a lot of work to do, um, and to start, I'm going to introduce you a little bit to how um, the meeting is going to work and how exactly uh, we're going to bring the voices of Pachyonychia, Pachyonychia congenita and Epidermolysis bullosa patients to FDA officials, uh, industry stakeholders, researchers, research stakeholders, uh, and many others in the room and on the web. So we have um, a unique uh, joint double header PFDD today. Um, as you're aware, we're gonna be spending the morning session uh, covering PC, hearing from PC patients and their loved ones and caregivers. And then uh, we're gonna hit the reset button over lunch and we're gonna come back in the afternoon uh, and work with EB patients and their loved ones and caregivers um, to explore their experiences and preferences. Um, the two sessions, the morning and afternoon sessions, uh, mirror one another. So the, um, the framework that I'm about to explain to you now will apply to both the morning and the afternoon. Um, so we've organized uh, our sessions to cover two topics which were alluded to by Dr. Bites. Um, first, we're going to explore the health effects and daily impacts of your conditions. So we're gonna ask you questions about what health effects have the most significant impacts on your life? Uh, what things in your life, activities or otherwise, um, are, that are important to you, um, are you either not able to do or not able to do as fully because of your conditions? We're gonna ask you about how these effects might uh, vary from day to day, as well as over time. And we wanna explore what worries you most about your conditions. Uh, the second topic we're going to approach as a group um, is going to focus on approaches to treatment, both current approaches and potential future treatments. 
So we're gonna ask you questions about what you're currently do, doing to try to treat your condition and its symptoms. We're gonna ask you how well those treatments work and what are their downsides. And then we're gonna to turn to the future and ask you what it is that you would look for from an ideal future treatment, um, assuming that uh, we might not be able, you know, short of a, a cure. Uh, we've developed a program that uh, hopefully, um, you know, from our experience, will um, be able to bring out uh, your experiences and preferences on those topics. Uh, so for both the morning and the afternoon, we're going to begin our discussions with a clinical overview. Um, both uh, will be provided by Dr. Anna Bruckner. Um, once we have that kind of uh, baseline framework um, of both PC and EB for each of our sessions, um, we're then going to turn it over to the real experts in the room, all of you, the patients and caregivers. Um, we're going to kick off our, uh, each of our topics uh, with a discussion from panel members, members of your own communities um, that have uh, graciously agreed to provide some prepared uh, comments and remarks about their own experiences. Uh, at the conclusion of the panel uh, discussions, uh, we're then going to open it up to the audience for your uh, your uh, participation both in the room and on the web. You'll be able to participate in polling questions. If you haven't already, um, when you registered, you should have received an email with uh, instructions on how to download an app that will allow you to uh, participate in polling. And in the programs that are in front of you, if you haven't already, uh, please go ahead and, and look at those directions and download that app. Um, once we finish with some polling questions, just to get a sense of who we have in the room um, and uh, kick off some of uh, the, the discussions around each of those two topics, um, we'll then open it up to a broad audience discussion. And so this will be an opportunity for all of you that have traveled here today uh, to participate uh, and provide comments um, to those questions that we are asking of you. Um, for those of you that are on by the web, we'll be following up with an email that will provide um, a survey with those same discussion questions and ask for your written comments. And we will be including those comments along with what we hear today in the room in the summary report for this meeting, which for both uh, PC and EB, PC Project and Deborah of America will be drafting voice of the patient reports, which are the summary report of this meeting to provide to FDA and to the public at large. So before we move into our uh, uh, clinical overview for PC, I do want to lay out some discussion ground rules. Um, you know, we have a, there's many of you in the room today, and we do only have so much time uh, to be able to um, have a discussion. So to make that as fruitful as possible, um, you know, we do encourage all of you uh, to participate and contribute to the dialogue. Um, we are going to hear from panelists first, but um, it's important for us to know both the similarities and differences in your experiences from what we hear on the panel. Um, so please contribute, even if it is you've, you feel that maybe your experience has already been represented. It's important for us to know commonalities within your own community. Um, FDA is here to listen, so uh, we won't be posing questions uh, to FDA, uh, although if, if FDA has questions, they can certainly um, raise their hand and, and ask a, a question during the audience discussion. But today, you are the experts. We're here to ask you the questions and try to learn from you. Um, you know, we know that your uh, today can be very personal. We're asking you to share your personal stories. Um, so please be respectful of one another, knowing that you all have different experiences and preferences. Um, and when we get to the uh, audience discussion, what I'll do is I'll just ask um, if you would like to speak, we're going to have microphones that will be brought around the room to you, and please wait for a microphone so that way our webcast participants uh, will be able to hear you and as well as others in the room. Um, but we'll just ask that you wait to be called upon, um, and then once you do, please um, you know, state your name and, and we can have a discussion. Um, so that's the, you know, how things will run. Um, we're going to start now with the PC portion of the agenda. And so I'd like to introduce our speaker for the clinical overview, which is Dr. Anna Bruckner. Dr. Bruckner is an associate professor of dermatology and pediatrics at the University of Colorado School of Medicine and director of pediatric dermatology at Children's Health Hospital Colorado. She attended Northwestern University as part of the honors program in medical education, earning her MD in 1997. She completed residencies in pediatrics and dermatology at the University of Colorado, 
followed by a fellowship in pediatric dermatology at the University of California, San Francisco. She maintains board certification in dermatology and pediatric dermatology. Dr. Bruckner is passionate about improving outcomes and quality of life for children with skin disorders through patient care, research, education, and advocacy. Her academic interests include genetic skin disorders, vascular uh, anomalies, atopic dermatitis, and complex patients. In PC, she's actually helped PC project by taking biopsies uh, from a number of PC patients back in 2012, uh, which were then sent to four different scientists in order to help advance PC research. So join me in welcoming Dr. Bruckner. Good morning. Thank you, James, for that introduction. Um, it really is a pleasure to be here representing patients with Pachyonychia congenita in EB. Um, and uh, as James mentioned, I will really be providing a general overview for, for each of these disorders, just to make sure that we're really all on the same page and know that we're talking about the same thing. But the stars of the show really are going to be the patients that you're going to be learning from, from later on. So um, without further ado, um, just as a formality disclosures, I do have some relationships with industry, none of which would be pertinent to this uh, presentation. So I'm going to start with a case presentation. Um, uh, this is a two-year-old child who was referred to me actually from out of state from another dermatologist. Um, his history was that he was born with funny-looking toenails, uh, which progressively worsened over time. At around the age of one, he started to develop blistering on his feet, and this generally progressed to developing thick areas of callus, or what we would call keratoderma in the medical literature. He also was fairly active, but did sometimes complain of pain, and his mom reported that in general, he really did not like for her to bother with his feet at all. Some additional findings that were subtle on his examination included some focal calluses on his palms, as well as a sort of white thickening of his tongue called leukokeratosis. And also, interestingly, his mother reported that he had started to develop teeth at two weeks of age, which is unusual. So based on this constellation of findings, I was suspicious that this child had pachynychia congenita, and I did refer him to PC Project, where he was able to undergo genetic testing to confirm that diagnosis. So what exactly is pachynychia congenita, or PC? It's an autosomal dominant genetic skin disorder, and it is quite rare. So we estimate that there are approximately only five to 10,000 people in the whole world that are affected with this condition. So you know we are all unique in our own ways, but if you have PC, you truly are one in a million. That is the incidence of this, the prevalence of this disorder. So in speaking tongue in cheek, you have more or less won the genetic lottery that you did not choose to participate in. <laughs> um, the onset of symptoms for this disorder can vary. Um, in some cases, it does present at birth. Um, the mean age is typically four years, but there are certainly reports of it starting or the symptoms starting later on, in, uh, even in adulthood. So um, if you read a typical dermatology textbook, they used to classify PC in two forms, PC1 and PC2. Um, but really, based on the work of PC Project, which has been remarkable in terms of genotyping affected individuals and cataloging their symptoms, um, we now know that there are really five affected genes, um, and the classification of, of PC corresponds to those, those particular genes. Uh, the genes more or less um, encode what are called keratins, and we're going to talk a little bit about that in the, next, um, in the next slide, how those keratins and the abnormalities in the keratins will lead to the symptoms that are seen in, in PC. So in all of the cells in our epidermis, um, the keratins more or less form a scaffolding or a structural network. There are different keratins that are expressed in the bottom layer of skin, uh, keratins 5 and 14. There, um, and higher up in the skin, in most cases, keratins 1 and 10 are expressed. Um, in PC, the keratins that are affected are keratin 6, uh, 16, and 17, and those are typically expressed sort of in the, the middle-ish part of the skin, but more highly relevant in areas such as the palms, the soles, the hair follicles, um, the oral mucosa, and the nails. 
Um, but in this example here, you can see how in those, those slides, the green, the green structures are more or less the keratin filaments forming this scaffolding that should give our cells a nice kind of, you know, give them, give them their shape. The mutations that we see in, in PC basically lead to structural um, weaknesses within those keratins so that they're really not able to withstand stress like they should. If you have a nice, you know, strong scaffolding, that's sort of analogous to your, your Eiffel Tower. It's stood the test of time, right? But if you have a weak scaffolding, that's sort of like having a house of cards, more or less. It is going to fall over very quickly. Um, but as a result of that structural fragility in, our care, in those keratins, the body actually sort of sends out distress signals and so the, and compensates by making the skin thicker in those affected areas. So you can imagine um, what's basically happening is that you have sort of a weak foundation, but in order to compensate for that, the skin grows up thicker. So you have this sort of uh, uh, pillar, more or less, of, of skin cells growing sort of on top of a weak, uh, unstable foundation. So the term pachynechia actually technically means thick nails. And as you can see here, there are several examples of, of thick nails. Thank you to Holly Evans from, from PC Project for helping me with some of these clinical pictures. Um, the classic sort of pachynechia congenita nail is sort of this, this U-shaped um, uh, nail where um, there's quite a bit of thick, you know, nail um, underneath kind of this, excuse me, um, hyper sort of curved curved nail, but this is really not necessarily typical for all patients with PC. And so I do think that the name PC or pachynechia congenita doesn't really kind of encompass all of the findings that we, that we see in this disorder. So this is really sort of the, the typical triad of findings that is seen in the majority of patients with PC. Plantar pain, so significant pain mainly involving the feet occurs in 95% or more of patients with PC. In addition, that is combined with these thick calluses, you could also call it hyperkeratosis or keratoderma, focal involving the feet, and in some cases involving the hands, and then also nail, nail thickening, again, predominantly involving the feet, but also in some cases involving the hands. So this triad of findings is seen in over 90% of patients with PC very important to recognize, the pain is very characteristic. Other findings that are seen in PC include cysts, so these are more or less kind of sacs or dilations that come from the hair follicles or other glandular structures in the skin. Also follicular hyperkeratosis or plugging in the hair follicles um, is another finding, more often kind of seen in children and um, adolescents and does tend to improve over time. Finally, um, this leukokeratosis or um, this kind of white change in the oral mucosa, particularly the tongue, this is again a, a result of thickening of that um, epithelium of the mouth. Um, in addition, um, some other oral findings that are less common include natal teeth or teeth occurring very early um, in, uh, in infancy, chelitis or sort of a sores um, on the sides of the mouth, a hoarse voice or hoarse cry due to involvement of the airway and larynx, and interestingly, what's been described by the work of PC Project is also this first bite syndrome or intense pain that some patients will feel um, when they um, uh, first, first, first eat or drink. I'd like to conclude by, you know, pointing out that there are no approved therapies for, for PC, and you are obviously going to be hearing more about treatment uh, uh, in, the, in the upcoming sessions. Um, patients will rely on nonspecific modalities in order to help them manage their callus, in order to manage their nails, and also to help control their pain. Um, what I'm hoping that you, know, you all will, will share with us and that what we will learn from you, know, you know, is about really what is really sort of the impact of, of um, the, the manifestations on your life, you know, what, what do you need to do in terms of managing this? I mean, and I, I know that you are going to share these experiences, but um, hopefully we will also see that what you are currently doing, it's really not, not perfect, is it? So we really do have a true gap in terms of um, developing better treatments for, for PC. Um, and um, uh, I know that you will convey, convey that the impact of this condition on your lives is, is very real. So with that, I will stop there. Um, that was my overview and we'll, um, I guess I'll turn it back over to James. Thank you.
So now we do get to turn it over to you. Um, we're gonna uh, go into our first set of polling questions, which is a set of demographic questions, just to get a sense of uh, who from the PC community we have in the room. We do ask that only PC patients and their caregivers participate in this. Um, these polls throughout the day, um, you know, uh, if you're here for the afternoon session and you're, you're observing and you're from the EV community, please hold off uh, until the afternoon polling. And if you are um, another stakeholder um, here, uh, whether a clinician or a researcher or member of industry, please also um, uh, do not participate in the polling as we would like to limit this to PC patients and caregivers. Um, so with that being said, if we could go to our uh, first set of polling questions. So the question, uh, we have six demographic questions and our first is, are you a patient or a caregiver or both? So A, respond to A if you're a patient, B if you're a caregiver uh, of a person with PC, or C if you're both a patient and a caregiver. And if you're having any technical issues trying to respond, please raise your hand and we'll uh, have run someone over to you to, to help you out with the app. Oh, we have one hand over there. Is there Holly's on her way. Is there anyone else that has not been able to participate in the poll? Okay. All right, so our audience today, both here in the room and online, we have uh, half of the participants are uh, PC patients um, that are not also caregivers. Um, a third of our participants are caregivers uh, and not patients. Um, and then the remainder are both uh, patients and caregivers. So uh, probably a very unique perspective, um, you know, both living with the condition and caring for someone. Next polling question. So the next question is, uh, where do you or the person you care for reside? I'd like to get a sense of uh, our regional makeup here, uh, both in the room and online. So. A, if you're on the East Coast, B, the West Coast, C, Mountain West, D, Central Area, or E, if you're outside of the U.S. I know it's early out on the West Coast. I would imagine that's going to pick up perhaps in a, a, you know, an hour or so. But, okay, give you a few more minute, uh, seconds to, to participate in this. All right, so it looks like the majority of our participants are from the central area. Um, I think that's actually uh, somewhat unusual for a meeting on the East Coast not to be uh, outnumbered by East Coasters. So uh, congratulations, guys. Um, then we have our East Coast representation, um, and we actually have um, some participation from outside of the U.S. Um, and it looks like we are not uh, at least yet represented by the Mountain West or the West Coast. Oh, um, Hallie, can you check to see if their um, response is going through? Hmm. Interesting. Okay. All right, so it looks like some of our, our responses are not showing up on the screen. Hopefully they're being logged so we'll at least be able to reference them. So um, sorry about that. Um, can I get a showing of hands of our Mountain West people in the room? All right, so we do have Mountain West and then what about West Coast? Okay, so we do have representation in the room. Um, that's great. Okay, so our third polling question.
Uh, it says, what, the question is, what is your age or the age of the person you care for? Um, and so if you are a patient that is also a caregiver, please respond for yourself for this question. Uh, so your uh, options are uh, A, zero to two years old, B, three to 12 years old, uh, C, three to 18 years old, uh, D, 18 to 25 years old, E, 26 to 45, F, 45 to 65, or G, older than 65. Just another test of this. Um, oh, Brett. Oh, all right. So I will be reading out the results since we have, uh, we're seeming to have some kind of displaying issues for the uh, PowerPoint slide. Okay, so we have representation actually across all of the age groups. Um, we have 3% represent represented for zero to two. Um, 16% for those at three to 12 years old, eight for 13 to 18, 10% for 18 to 25, and then we have a, about a third of the people represented are in the age range of 26 to 45, um, a quarter representing those 46 to 65, and we do have about 10% represented for those older than 65, so uh, good representation across uh, all age groups. We'll go to our next polling question. Okay, so our next question is, which of those uh, PC genes is your specific mutation found? Um, a for K6A, B for K6B, C for K6C, D for K16, and E for K17. I'll give you a moment to respond to this polling question. Okay, so it looks like uh, about 40% of you, um, your PC gene is uh, found on uh, K6A, 6% for K6B, 2% for K6C, uh, th about a third of you for K16, and then about one-fifth of you for K17. Um, so those of you with K6B and K6C, we're going to you know, there's not many of you, but hopefully you'll uh, be brave and, and share some of your experiences too, since you're in the minority today. Uh, our next question, please. Okay, so this question is, um, do you have either A, a spontaneous mutation, that's where no other uh, family members have PC, or B, an inherited mutation, where others in your family have PC? a moment to respond to this and in this case we actually have a match <laughs> uh, so um, more than half of you have an inherited mutation and a little bit less than half of you have a spontaneous mutation uh, so that concludes our demographic polling um, we're now going if my uh, panel one panelists will join us on stage um, we're now going to move into uh, our discussion of topic one, which is really focused on the burdens and symptoms of living with PC. Um, so here, um, starting with our panel, moving into another set of polling questions and audience discussion, uh, we really want to hear from you what are the most burdensome aspects of your disease and what are the impacts um, of those aspects and symptoms of your disease on your daily life. Um, we're interested in knowing how that changes day to day over the years um, and what really worries you about having PC. So our first panel is made up of a, a great selection of individuals uh, who I know have worked really hard in preparation for today. We have Jack, Jack Padovano, Christine Block, Nicole Lee, James Riddle, Tara Aditi, and then as our fill-in for our six panelists, 
Um, we've actually brought together a compilation of several voices of PC members uh, or members of the PC community to try to help uh, get a broader representation uh, from the community and their experiences with PC. So with that, I will turn it over to Jack. Good morning. Uh, my name is Jack Padovano. I'm 56 and I live in Phoenix, Arizona, and my genetic mutation is on keratin gene 16. And that is my foot and my arch nemesis. Uh, my PC shows up with thick calluses on over 50% of the bottom of both feet, cracks and occasional blisters along the middle and sides of most calluses, and thickened nails on 100% of my fingers and toes. Like most people, I have a bank account, but not the kind that you're probably thinking about. This one isn't filled with money, but instead it's filled with the number of steps that I can physically walk each day before tremendous pain sets in for me. And just like a checking account filled with money, I spend it very wisely or try my best. Each withdrawal or step that I take is mentally recorded and physically felt right down to my bones. Overnight while I sleep, the bank account is refilled before I wake up. The amount of the refill varies. If I overdrew from the account the day before by walking too much, I have fewer steps in the account. If I got a good night's rest and monitored my walking the previous day, the account is in full, on full. On my best day, I can walk down a long city block without thinking once about the pain. On my worst, I simply refuse to walk, period. Unfortunately, there are very few best days. If I'm lucky, I get one a month. Most days I think about the pain with each and every step, including standing in place. PC hurts both physically and emotionally. PC pain for me feels like someone is sticking pins and needles in the bottom of my feet constantly. It's a deep ache that cuts all the way to the bone. I treat the pain with hot water soaks, cold water soaks, elevating my feet, rubbing creams, massage, Vaseline baths, Advil, and a lot of bitching, mostly under my breath. I tr treat my PC by paring down the calluses once a week, trying to navigate those pesky blood vessels and nerve endings that get cut and inflamed and bleed in the process. Nothing really works. The pain is constant and often makes me grouchy, sometimes to the point of lashing out to the people that I love, work with, and sometimes even total strangers. I think it even contributes to my struggle with depression. PC makes my fingernails ugly, so ugly that growing up, other kids made fun of me. PC makes me walk weird something we PCers affectionately call the PC walk. But kids being kids, they didn't see any humor or have any compassion for my walk. I was just different, and that made me a target for bullying. The really mean kids took to stomping on my feet, so hard I would fall to the ground and writhe in pain. And as those with PC in this room can attest, the last thing we PCers need is more trauma to our feet. PC also significantly impacted my parents. After my diagnosis at three years old, this was the 1960s, my parent had a name for my condition, but that's all they had. No treatment, no answer why, or especially no cure. In fact, they were told the condition would most likely worsen to the point where I could never walk again. And my mom, she was certain it was her fault. She would often say, maybe if I smoked less, ate differently, didn't take aspirin, et cetera, et cetera. Today, we know none of that matters. I'm a spontaneous case, meaning that I won that lottery. As an adult, the bullying has stopped, but it's replaced by questions mostly thoughtful and kind, but sometimes not. Questions 
I really don't like to answer because the answers are never simple one word answers. Recently, I learned that the average person walks 10,000 steps per day. It's about five miles. I'm envious. That's a big bank account. For me, I'm lucky to get a quarter mile in or 250 steps before the pain sets in. So while my account may not be as rich as yours, I treasure every step that I take. Future forward, I worry that my condition will worsen as I get older. I know my pain has gotten progressively worse every year, particularly in the last 20 years or so. I can see it in my walk and feel it in my bones. So my wish is simple. I want to stand and walk without excruciating pain. I hope and pray that's not too much to ask. Thank you for listening. Good morning. My name is Christine Block. I'm from Wausau, Wisconsin. My, hus my husband and I have two daughters, Aaron, who's 10, and Allison is eight. I also has, have my doctorate in physical therapy. I'm here today as a parent of a PC patient. Allison has PC. Allison was diagnosed with PC when she was two months old and was genetically confirmed with K6A by the time she was six months old. Allison's PC was caused by a spontaneous mutation, so no one else in our family has PC. We had never heard of PC before she was diagnosed. I immediately started researching PC and connected with PC Project. I quickly learned that PC is ultra rare, painful, and there are no effective treatments. Allison's symptoms from PC started as an infant with leukokeratosis, a white film of keratin on her tongue, and first bite syndrome, which caused pain with feeding. She would cry the first few minutes of nursing, especially in the middle of the night. Fortunately, she outgrew with that by about six months old. Allison also has follicular hyperkeratosis, small bumps or plugs of keratin that form around her hair follicles, on her knees, underwear line, elbows, and other areas of friction. At times, they catch on things and become sore. All of Allison's fingernails and toenails are thick. We have to file down her nails regularly. She also has had some nail infections. They usually occur after she has bumped or bruised a nail and result in a swollen, red, throbbing finger. We have, we have to ice it and try to relieve the pressure or drain it, and at times she has needed antibiotics. All of these symptoms have caused problems, but the foot pain, blisters, and calluses are the worst. Allison started developing some small blisters and calluses on her feet when she started walking. When Allison was a toddler, she would get a callus or a blister, and it would get better and go away. Now she always has some calluses on her feet. We help her regularly trim and shave down the calluses. As she has gotten older, heavier, and more active, the calluses and blisters have gotten worse. One of the first times Allison asked about her PC was one morning driving to daycare. Allison was three and a half, and she looked at her sister and asked why her feet were different from Aaron's. With tears in my eyes, I explained that she has PC, and God makes all of us different and special. Allison has had kids stare and ask her questions about her feet and her nails. She simply says that's the way she was born. So far, she hasn't had much teasing, but I fear it will come as she gets older. Each year when school starts, I talk to Allison, Allison's teachers and I educate them about PC. I make sure they understand that Allison is living with daily foot pain and they need to let her sit down if she asks. Currently, Allison is in second grade. She is a tough kid and she doesn't want to miss out, so she will push through the pain. But by the end of the day, it is getting the best of her. I often see her limping as she walks home, less than a block after getting off the bus. Some days are worse than others, but the pain is always there. I'm sure as she gets into middle school and high school, she will have to use crutches or a wheelchair to make it through the day. Allison played soccer during the summer for a couple years. After a soccer game, she would limp to the car. At home, she would cry because 
of the foot pain and just standing in the bathroom at night to brush your teeth was extremely painful. The time running and the heat of the summer made her foot pain worse. Last summer she did not play because we decided as a family the pain was not worth it. We live in Wisconsin and the summers can be hot and humid. Heat and humidity cause more sweat and moisture, which leads to more blisters. Winters are a little better, but she still has daily foot pain. Allison's PC diagnosis has also affected our family life. When we plan family activities, we have to think about how far we have to walk, how, how long Allison will have to be on her feet. Last summer, we went to Bryce Canyon National Park, and Allison couldn't walk up a couple of short trails because of her foot pain. My husband carried her piggyback to see a couple sites. This winter we went snow tubing. It was a busy day, and after standing in line to ride up and tube down the hill a few times, Allison had to be carried to the car because her feet hurt. Allison only has so much time on her feet or steps each day. As a mother, it breaks my heart to see my child suffer. I see her condition slowly getting worse. I worry about how she will get around in high school and college. Her feet already limit the sports she can do com comfortably. I am concerned that she won't be able to choose her ideal career because she won't be able to stand or walk long enough. Finding treatments for the foot pain caused by PC will improve Allison's quality of life and open many doors for her future and for all PC patients. Thank you. and I'm 32 years old. In 2011, I was diagnosed as PCK-17. I'm so honored to come here today and share my experience on having lived with PC. This day is truly a dream come true to be able to be involved in something bigger than myself. I believe that today represents a breakthrough for so many people who are affected by PC. For me and my three boys, PC had affected our skin, nails, teeth, feet, and hair. It was like it had many other faces to it. It didn't only single out one thing, but it had caused a domino effect of many painful symptoms and abnormalities to those areas of our body. Every day, it is a fight for us. Every day, I find myself fighting the good fight of faith. I have to be determined in my heart not to let the pain and symptoms steal my joy. I have to be determined to not let this condition turn me into a recluse and make me pass up on opportunities to enjoy life. Because just like with any sickness or disease, PC has the potential to destroy its victims mentally, emotionally, and physically. It is a fight every day to stay hopeful and encouraged that our better day is right around the corner. And I believe that today is a marker to that better day. Even before I ever knew these symptoms belonged to a condition that had a name to it, I would look at myself in the mirror at times and imagine that I didn't see all the hideous scars and bumps that this condition tried to leave on my body. I would look at my children when they were in pain from being on their feet for more than 30 minutes and imagine them running and standing and doing all the things that they enjoyed doing that this condition had tried to stop them from doing. I would make collages of beautiful feet, nails, and skin and form my own picture of myself and my three boys in my mind to help me to stay encouraged, to keep on living, to not be depressed, and to look forward to that one day where I would see myself and my three boys completely healed and whole. The condition had caused so much bruising to my body over the years, from flare-ups of boils that would leave behind dark marks on my skin. Some of the cysts that were usually under the skin would become inflamed and would turn into huge painful boils that had to be lanced. And even after they were lanced, it would always take a while to heal because they were so deep and big. When it did finally heal, it left an indentation in my skin. I could literally, at times, push my finger into my skin and still feel the deepness of where the boil had been. Not to mention that after being lanced or having a sack removed, it would sometimes return and be even bigger than it was before. I would get these hard, painful knots under the skin. Sometimes my skin oozed to the point where it would leak through a shirt or wherever the open wound would happen to be. I wouldn't even allow my husband to rub lotion on my back because there was one particular time that when he did, one of the wounds started to ooze right down my back and it had created a very embarrassing situation for me. This was one of the reasons I tried to stay completely covered up at all times, no matter if it was hot or cold outside. Summertime would always be the most difficult time with this condition because I would get some of the most painful boils. 
It's almost as if the heat was causing the blood to boil and caused the boils to be so severe. When I was younger and living with this condition, right at puberty age, I would get one at a time, but in adulthood, I noticed that they came more often, and sometimes there were five to seven at a time. The pain from those boils could be so excruciating that when I would experience a flare-up, it would make me so miserable and feeling like I just wanted to stay in one place and not move at all. Sometimes I would get them in the pelvic area until I couldn't even walk, or if they're on my backside, I couldn't sit down. There were times when my husband would come home from work to see me crawling behind our three-year-old or crawling from the floor and up on a stool to prepare dinner. I've had to watch my 10-year-old son have to ice his feet after a basketball game and stay off them for a week or so because his condition had brought on severe pain from the pressure he was putting on the calluses that had covered the soles of his feet. He has even hitched rides with his two younger brothers in our three-in-one stroller. So we have had to push our three boys in a stroller way beyond the normal stroller age to try and save their feet. And we just got rid of that stroller two and a half years ago because with them growing and of course weight increasing, the stroller could not hold them anymore. So things like hoverboards, electric scooters, and bikes or even pushing them in shopping carts has had to become our walking companions during times where walking is painful. And for me, I have had to accommodate this condition over the years by staying at home since being on my feet had created problems for me with existing calluses that were there and with the threat of new ones possibly forming if I was required to stand. So I opened my own transcription business where I could work from home and still contribute to our financial obligations. This truly been our unshakable faith in the word of God and the knowledge of Jesus Christ and all that he's accomplished for us that has kept us imagining and dreaming to see a complete and total breakthrough where PC is concerned. Not only in our lives, but in the lives of so many other people. And I really consider this day a major breakthrough and an open door to getting us one step closer to seeing that dream being manifested. Thank you so much again. Good morning. Ladies and gentlemen, it's an honor to be here in front of you today. My name is James Riddle. I'm from the Chicago area. And later this year will be my 50th birthday. My PC is hereditary. My father was a fraternal twin, spontaneous K16, L132P. He had a hard time growing up in the 40s and 50s in the coal mining areas of Pennsylvania. I now know he suffered from depression. I've been aware since I was nine he suffered from alcoholism and was very verbally and mentally abusive. I would imagine if he was here today, he could speak to you about pain, both physical and mental, and both due to PC. Part of our story I want you to understand today is PC doesn't just affect us, but it forms us and it encompasses us. It affects the people around us by how we control it or it controls us. And that can change daily and hourly due to pain. I've cried, I mean really cried, three times in my life because of PC, and I want to share those with you today. First, as a young boy after playing outside all day, I was sitting on the floor in my room at night examining my newly developed day's blisters on my feet to see which ones I could pop. This was not a pleasant evening ritual. However, I did this regularly as I grew taller and heavier because more blisters and calluses were constantly developing. Probably to your horror, sterile is not a word I care about even today. When I need to relieve the pressure of a blister, especially under a nail, anything sharp will do. The blisters would dry overnight. I would peel the dead skin away in the morning and have a normal pink skin area, but pretty much guaranteeing to have another blister in the same spot that night. So I was popping blisters when down the hallway I heard my mother and sister arguing, but all I could make out was my sister saying, his feet really stink and I'm sick of it. Now as a young boy, in addition to dealing with blisters, infections that I thought were cloudy blisters, developing calluses, red sore spots, and pain, I had something else to worry about. I closed my bedroom door, crawled over to my bed, went under the covers, and I cried while wishing that a car accident could somehow chop off my feet. And I would be okay with that. Second, as a young teenager, due to my PC, I became introverted. I wasn't into playing sports because of not being able to run more than a couple of minutes without sitting down due to pain. With a somewhat less than ideal home life due to PC, I was not a good student and I did not do well in school. 
After high school, my options were limited, and I got a job working outside, manual labor, where I had to wear, of all things, steel-toed boots. Before long, after a bad weather day of soaking cold rain, being on my feet all day, I managed to make it very slowly to my car, where it hurt to press the gas pedal. After crawling up the stairs to my apartment, I got inside the door and collapsed, in pain, and I broke down. I struggled for a very long time to take off my shoes, and I cried myself to sleep, just inside the door, fully dressed, on the floor. The third time, I was a new father when my wife called me into our daughter's bedroom. She was about nine months old and starting to crawl, and I had been watching her very closely, as you could imagine. My wife had just finished giving her a bath and was cutting her nails. She asked me to look at her little toe and said, what is that? I knew immediately with one look that it was PC. I turned to my wife and said, that's it. She has the calluses. I walked down the hall to our bedroom, closed the door behind me, and collapsed, crying the hardest I've ever cried, because I know what it means to have PC, painful calluses, and I do not wish that on anyone, let alone my child. I understand my father a little more today. As a final note, I'd like to add that I could not be prouder that now 16-year-old, she sits here in the audience. I have and would continue to help her in any way and every way I can, like being here today with all of you. Not just hoping for a better tomorrow, but doing something about it. I will push her to not be controlled by her PC, physically, mentally, or emotionally, but most of all, to not suffer the pain that I have suffered. However, I'm sure that through living, she will have her own stories of struggles and endurance, and she will have stories about pain. Forget running and hiking. Walking and standing are difficult at best, because there's no life with PC that doesn't include pain. Ladies and gentlemen, I will push you like my daughter while continuing to give you all the help I can. I will be uncompromising like my PC. I want a cure. If it exists in the universe, we just have to find it. Thank you for your time. Hi, my name is Tara Atai. I am 23 years old, and I was diagnosed with PC at the age of two. Living with PC is not easy. It affects you on an emotional and physical level. I would like to start out by talking about the physical pain and then get more into the emotional pain. The emotional pain is what I believe to be the worst part of this disease and that affects you the most. I would like everyone to bear with me for a second and close your eyes. Imagine yourself barefoot with no shoes, no socks, just your bare feet and nothing else. Now imagine yourself stepping on a bed of misshapen, sharp, hard rocks. Stand there for a second as gravity does its job and pushes you deeper, your feet deeper and deeper into the rocks. Now you may open your eyes. I bet that made you feel a little bit uncomfortable. Well, that's how I feel every day. My pain fluctuates, um, my pain fluctuates its intensity, meaning that sometimes it's bearable and sometimes I'm at the point where I can't even stand. But I'm one of the lucky ones. My PC was genetic, not spontaneous like the others. My father has PC and I'm lucky because I grew up learning how to manage the pain that comes with PC. But the one pain none of us seem to know how to relieve is a never ending itch. Having a father who has PC is great and all, but it's also hard to have him understand the things that I have to go through as a girl. As a female, I grew up feeling a bit of pressure to be perfect. When I was younger, I did not care much about what people thought about my PC until I started being bullied in elementary school for how I looked. This is what led me to feel self-conscious about my PC, and I try my best to hide it. I honestly cannot remember the last time that I left the house without socks on or went 10 minutes without nail polish on. Whenever people ask me why I walk weird, I say it's because of a sports injury even, that never healed even though I've never played sports. I stuck with this lie for years. It took me seven years to come out and tell my best friend the truth. I felt like I needed to lie to my friends because I did not want them to treat me differently. I did not want them to see me as someone who is broken, and I did not want them to ask me if I was okay or if I needed a break. I know my limits, and I know when the time comes, I'll push through the pain to do what I want to do. 
A few years ago, my family and I went on a trip to Italy. We did a lot of sightseeing, which required a lot of walking. Now, the one place I really wanted to see on this trip was the Vatican. We got a tour of the Vatican Museum, which was one of, which was great, and it was fine up until halfway through when the pain started. I was at the point of dying from pain, and my family kept telling me, if you're in pain, let's go. But I kept saying, no, I really want to see this museum. When we finally finished our tour, I was about to collapse. My sister gave me a piggyback ride to the taxi stand where we got back to the hotel and I felt crying from the pain. One of my biggest fears of PC is passing it down to my child and having them go through the things that I had to go through. I hope one day there's a cure so no one really, no one has to experience going through this. Thank you. The worst thing about PC is the pain and uh, unlike a lot of other conditions, it's a pain that's always there, but it's a pain that a lot of people can't see, so it's pretty hard to get across for them to understand how much it uh, can affect you. A treatment for PC would go a long way to helping the pain, that's the main thing. For me, as a PC patient, pain is one of the things I deal with on a daily basis, and uh, managing the pain is one of the most important parts. If I can manage the pain to the point where it's not as painful as it would be if I didn't have the tools available um, that prevents the pain, um, that's, that, that would make a much better day in life for me. I have PC. It, I get calluses and blisters on my feet. It usually hurts when I'm running around a lot and when I'm standing still for a really long time. If they can make a cure for this, I would wish that the cure was to make, they could make it go away forever, but if they couldn't make it go away forever, I would just wish that they could make it stop hurting so that I could run around a lot. The pain just consumes you constantly. Pain has been so bad to where I, I would just be crawling around my house for a couple of days, and, and at that point my feet were in terrible condition. And I just thought, you know, pain, you know, if you could only feel the pain that I'm in. I mean, they have no idea what pain is when every step you take is, is literally, it's like, uh, it's just hell every step you take. The worst part about having PC is that unknown pain factor. When I get up every single morning and get out of bed, that first step on the ground, I know it's going to be painful, and it is and I dread it, and I lose my balance because the pain is so bad, it's hard to walk. But the second thing is the fact that I'm so dependent on other people to help me with everything. The worst thing about PC is when I grow older, it's gonna hurt more, and I won't get to do as many things as I get to do now. Yes, they don't understand. When you say, they usually say, somebody will see you and say, um, did you hurt your ankle? And I say, no, I just have really bad feet. Well, what's wrong with them? Well, I have these calluses. Oh, yeah, my Aunt Gert had calluses, and, you know, you know, she worked in a factory or whatever. My uncle was a paratrooper, and he had calluses, and, you know, but these are different, you know, like, they just don't understand different calluses, you know. I said, it feels like you're walking on stones in your shoes, you know. It's a different kind of callus. When you sit down, the pain doesn't go away. It changes from more acute to um, more of a throbbing, burning, you know, so it's, it's pain just in a different format. I would say the worst thing for me about having PC is the pain um, that comes from just day-to-day -day activities. Um, the worst part about it for me is just not being able to do uh, the simple tasks that other people can do, um, such as just like walking to class or um, being able to help out with like moving things. I always have to be really careful about uh, how much I do every day um, and sometimes that limits my ability to interact with other people, um, to participate as much as I want to and then even if I do uh, hold myself back, um, I still have to suffer the repercussions for it. 
So I think probably the biggest thing that I would want a treatment for PC to do um, would be to address the pain. Uh, the relief and the possible future that might. possible future of my grandnephew having the pain lightened and maybe even cleared up and maybe his future and his wife and his child would not have the uh, the 16k that we have uh, right now the problem is no one saw my condition and no one saw the pain many nights going home ba barely able to walk barely able to walk, is to find solutions to the pain and perhaps the cure. But the first step is lessen the pain. So join me in thanking our panel for being brave and starting us off today. So now we're going to uh, transition our uh, discussion of this topic of the burdens and symptoms of living with PC uh, to the broader audience. And we're going to go to our polling questions on topic one. So go ahead and pull out your phones and get on the app again, um, and we'll go ahead and work through these. Um, so our first question for you is, overall, how would you characterize your PC disease severity or the severity of the person you care for who uh, compared to someone without PC? And your response options are moderate, which is while I have symptoms, I am able to, on most days, manage those symptoms and live a healthy, normal life without limitations. Moderate, PC has an impact on my everyday life and on some days limits my ability to function normally due to ambulation challenges, pain, uh, or otherwise. C, severe, PC is debilitating to my everyday life, and in many cases it limits my abilities to live a normal life due to ambulation challenges, pain, or otherwise. Or D, unbearable, PC at times causes me to withdraw from society. I feel it is different, difficult to continue on, and occasionally I have suicidal thoughts. you a, a minute to think about that and respond. I'm, I'm looking to the, to the back corner to let me know. We're good? We're, we're aligned. So, um, and he looks like uh, our responses are in and uh, all of you um, rate your PC severe, disease severity as severe, meaning that to you, you're, no, okay, so we're not aligned. So I will do my best to, to look. It might actually be easy for you all to see than me. So it looks as though um, the majority of you do read it as severe, your PC disease severity, um, but uh, a significant amount of you, uh, just slightly less than that, rated as moderate, um, about 10% unbearable, and less than 10% mild. We can move to our second question, which is, uh, which PC conditions have impacted your life? And here we're going to ask you to check all that apply. Um, so your, your options for PC uh, conditions or symptoms are A, thickened nails, B, painful calluses and blisters on the soles of your feet, C, painful calluses and blisters on your hands, D, painful blood vessels or nerves in calluses, E, deep persistent itch in feet, F, infections in nails or feet, 
G, painful cysts, H, uh, follicular hyperkeratosis, which are little bumps on your waist, legs, arms, or uh, elsewhere that cause irritation, I, leukokeratosis, which is the white uh, growth on your tongue, G, trouble feeding as a baby, or K, other. And you should be able to see all of those options in the app. Please select all that apply. Give you another moment to respond to this question. Okay, so it looks like the uh, two uh, most uh, common um, PC conditions are the thickened nails and painful calluses and blisters on the soles of your feet. Although uh, for pretty much all of the others, there um, uh, are a, a fairly uh, wide distribution of responses. Um, and then it looks like there are some others. So when we get to the audience discussion, um, for those of you who have experienced things that were not listed on here, um, please um, chime in with those so we can understand what other symptoms of PC you experience. Can we move to our third question? So this question is, do you typically feel some level of pain with every step that you walk? Yes or no? one a little bit easier to respond to, just a binary choice, A, yes, or B, no. So of our PCers here in the room and on the web, it looks like 95% of you uh, do experience pain um, when standing and walking, uh, and 5% of you do not experience that. And so uh, for those of you who do not experience uh, pain, be uh, interesting to explore why that is. Um, you might be a, a, perhaps a caregiver of someone um, young or perhaps you uh, only experience other manifestations of PC. Can we go to our fourth question? So our fourth question is, how has your PC changed over time or with age? Uh, a, has it gotten better? B, has it gotten worse? Or C, has it stayed the same? One more moment. Has your PC changed over time? If so, has it gotten better? Has it gotten worse? Or if it hasn't, you can select C, that it stayed the same. Okay. Um, so for the uh, vast majority of you, your PC has gotten worse over time. Um, we'll definitely want to explore how that, um, how your condition has, has gotten worse. Um, and then it looks like we have about 15% of you where your PC has stayed the same over time. Um, and some of, for some of you, uh, 5%, it has actually gotten better over time. Could we go to our fifth question? So our fifth question is, how do your PC symptoms affect your daily like, life? And here, uh, again, we're gonna ask you to select all that apply. A, does it limit your walking? B, limit your standing? C, limit your ability to work consistently and effectively. D, limits the types of jobs you can realistically perform. E, it partially or completely limits your ability to participate in activities. F, it causes depression or discouragement. G, it causes difficulty sleeping. H, causes difficulty socializing. I, uh, it forces you to hide your nails or your bare feet. And J, it forces you to make up stories about the uh, about why you walk the way you do, why you, your nails are or your feet are the way that they are, instead of having to uh, explain your PC. So a lot of different uh, aspects of, of living with uh, PC in your daily life. Please select all that apply.
in just one more moment. Okay, so uh, it looks like the uh, symptom with the high, or the impact with the highest response is limiting uh, your walking. Uh, after that, it's uh, limiting uh, either partially or completely your ability to participate in activities uh, or your standing. Um, and then after that, it, you know, there's still uh, very high uh, responses across the other categories, the lowest of them um, being uh, causing difficulty with sleeping. Okay, and can we go to our final topic one polling question? Okay, so this question is, in living with PC, what situations create the greatest stresses and or worries in your life? And again, check all that apply. A, job security and employment issues. B, fear of disease worsening. C, social issues. D, family life issues. E, caring for yourself as you grow older. F, lack of ability to participate in activities. G, living with pain. And H, embarrassment. So which things worry you or stress you the most in your life about living with PC? Select all that apply. All right. I'll give you just one more moment. Okay, so it looks like um, we'll just confirm that uh, those things that worry or stress you the most about living with PC um, are the lack of the ability to participate in activities and living in pain. Um, after that, uh, the highest, next highest uh, kind of batch of responses uh, are embarrassment uh, as well as the fear of your disease worsening. Um, and then there was uh, still um, high responses to the other options with the lowest being um, family life issues. Okay. So now we move to the part of the, the program where we're gonna ask you in the audience um, to build on what we've heard from, from the panel, from what you've shared in your polling question, uh, responses um, to help us really further understand uh, what it is like to live with PC, PC uh, what it is that you experience in your daily life. Um, so to start, you know, uh, let's start with uh, the thing that we heard the most. So from what I heard from the panel and from what I saw in your polling responses, we've heard that excruciating pain when standing or walking is the greatest burden for the most of you. Not all of you, but the most of you. Um, it sounds though that there's a range of different pain severity that you experience um, and that results in different impacts on your daily life. Um, so what I would like um, to hear from the audience is help me understand um, how your, you know, the level of pain that you experience affects your daily life. Um, help me understand what activities you can or cannot participate <coughs> in. And you know, when you're sharing this, please feel free to share examples like our panelists did in how those, um, how uh, the pain and the activities that you can or can't do uh, actually manifest in your experiences. So, do we have anyone that wants to, to break the ice? Oh, we've got a hand right up here in front. <coughs> and uh, when you start, please just, so for those on the webcast and actually so we can reference this when we're putting together um, the summary report, Please say your name and the PC gene affected. That you Hi, um, my name is Sarah Delante and I have K6A. Many of you probably are wondering why I'm not barefoot today. Um, <clears throat> last night I wanted to put together some thoughts about my PC and it's life with my mostly invisible PC. As I lay down here to write about my life with PC, specifically K6A, something's distracting me. This is a paper cut, like throbbing, <coughs> pinching, cutting glass ping in my lower right foot. Oh yes, indeed, my PC will not let me forget that it is here. 
this is what PC is, a constant painful reminder that my body has betrayed my spirit. Just when I think I can relax or rest, my PC reminds me that it is still here. Some with when I want, same with when I want to walk somewhere. I'm considering the distance, I'm counting the steps, at the same time checking in with my PC. Are my shoes too tight, too high, too loose, too new, too old, too soggy? Am my PC spongy, sweaty or not? Is it dry, is it sore, or is it just so-so? Sometimes I think, hey, maybe this is a good day. My feet aren't sore at all, but no shoe is ever a good fit. I try all <coughs> kinds of shoes except for those pretty Barbie doll 1950s pumps. So I strap on my shoes du jour and venture outside for a walk. Minutes later, my feet have betrayed me. Nope, they throb a little, then a little more. Then my wonderful shoes turn into instruments of torture. My PC screams, sit down, get these things off. What's the matter with you? You must have forgotten about me, but oh no. Not forgotten, never forgotten. I try to reason and I bargain with my PC. If I can just stand on my feet one more hour to finish this job, I will gladly take another ibuprofen. Who cares if it clouds up my contacts? Who needs their liver anyway? If I can just do my grocery shopping, laundry and errands around town, I will rest. I will give up cooking dinner and playing with my kids. I'll skip walking in the park with my husband. I'll skip walking the dog. Or I will keep going all day long despite the fire in my shoes. The next day, unable to move. Then the sadness and disappointment arrive. They are good friends with my PC. Not my favorites. My optimistic spirit lets them go. I do not allow for long visits. When my PC is angry, I try to calm it down. I use ointments, oils, lotions, potions, soft feathery motions, ibuprofen, lidocaine, CBD, hemp, marijuana, alcohol, and Epsom salts, menthol, wintergreen, tea tree, and ice water baths. I've walked around barefoot in the snow, but my PC still stings, especially in the spring. I, stand, I sand my feet with power tools meant for drilling wood or metal. I cut my own feet with single and double-edged razor blades. My PC is angry. My PC is stubborn. My PC, it seems, is here to stay. But hope, I'm not going to let it get the best of me. I've had dreams of myself without PC. In my dreams, I peel off my blisters and calluses to find normal, smooth skin. I'm not crying through wretched pain anymore. I'm flying. I'm finally free. And then I wake up, usually to a crazy burning itch or a jolt of electricity in my feet, or worse, to my toes curling up underneath my feet, cramping so much so that I have to jump out of bed and firmly place my foot on the ground so that they do not do that. Pain so sharp that I have to shriek out, shriek out loud. I wake up my husband. The people in my life without PC are mostly patient and kind, but I see the disappointment when I can't join in. It breaks my heart. I can't ski with them. I can't walk more than a few yards. Or if I do, I pay the price of being unable to do anything for a day or two afterwards. I worry about those times when I simply cannot move or be active. I do not want heart disease or obesity. I know how important it is to move. My PC, however, is ignorant to that reality. It does not care about broken hearts or disappointments. It wants what it wants. It must tend to its needs. It is relentlessly self-serving. It is a force. I am one with PC, and the PC is one with me. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you for, for putting together your thoughts and sharing those with us. And you covered so many of the topics um, that we want to talk about today. Um, you know, so thank you for you know, sharing the physical manifestation and how that evolves throughout the day and um, the things that you forego in your daily life 
because you have to make those hard choices um, about you know what you you know can do and can't do and whether you that day can pay the price and are willing to pay the price the next day as you said um, in our next session we definitely will want to ex explore more about all the the rinds of lotions and potions and everything that you try to do to manage your PC um, but thank you so much for sharing about all those burdens and impacts on your daily life um, so who else would like to share about how the impacts of of standing and walking uh, and the pain associated with that and the impacts on your daily life. We'll, we'll go here and then we'll come to Robert. My name is Jamie Simpson. I have K-17. Um, I've dealt daily since I was 15 with my feet. Um, the cyst is extremely painful as well. It makes the depression come in very heavily mm -hmm. because I feel like I'm not worthy enough to be a wife or a mother. It's hard to have intimacy when you're ashamed of the way you look. You feel sick because you hurt so bad. Um, and I would just like to say that I met someone at a meeting and he had spoke to me and told me he tried to take his life. And I begged him, please don't do that again. And he told me he couldn't promise me that. <laughs> However, I have looked for him for several years and I have not found him. And my thoughts and prayers go out to him in hopes that he changed his thought pattern. But every single day, it crosses my mind that a bullet wouldn't hurt near as bad as the PC. But with my beliefs, I do not agree with taking my life. However, now my daughter has it, and I watch her lay in bed every day. And it's very, very hard. Sure. Yeah, thank and you. it's hard for me because I feel like people doesn't understand, even mm -hmm. my husband sometimes. Mm -hmm. He doesn't understand because he, he sees me, mm -hmm. but he doesn't feel it. Mm -hmm. And what would be the type of thing that you know, would be an example of where he might not understand? What type of you know, scenario or, or activity might you not be able to do? Well, you know, um, we own a property management company. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, a lot of times the help's called in sick. They need, he needs me to come and help. We may have to move furniture, mm -hmm. houses. By the end of the day, I can't even pick my feet up off the ground. I'm dragging mm -hmm. my feet because I can't even bend my knees anymore. Mm -hmm. I fall a lot due to the instability of, of the pressure mm -hmm. if I step wrong. I've learned now how to fall. Mm -hmm. You kind of just throw yourself into a roll wow. instead of falling and trying to catch yourself mm -hmm. because if you try to catch yourself, you're, you're going to break your bones mm -hmm. and everything. So I think I've become a little bit of a stunt person. <laughs> And you look around for the softest place mm -hmm. to drop and roll. Wow. So I just want to let everyone know it is a very serious thing and it is mentally and physically very challenging. Yes. No. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Bob Baker and uh, I have K6A. Um, I've had, I battled uh, PC into a uh, stalemate, and I'm pretty good right now, but I'm not here to talk about me. I'm here to talk about my son, Cameron. Cameron died January 3rd. He, um, he had PC, I gave it to him. His calluses on his feet 
were extremely thick to the point of bruising his bones in his feet and affecting the way the bones grew in his feet, which gave him even more pain on top of the pain of PC. He went away to college and along with studying, he also blazed a path in trying to find a cure for his own pain. It involved um, pain clinics and he received some kind of, nothing, nothing to deal with his real pain, um, but like Lyrica and Gab, Gabby something, I don't know. He was able to find um, opioids, which apparently people will sell you, but doctors don't. No one was willing to prescribe them for his pain, so he went out and find, found his own. The pills don't last. So then he had to go on to find heroin. And he used heroin, and he had an overdose, and he was brought back from that. And that was two years ago. And he fought his addiction, but he lost January 3rd. I came and found him in his room. <laughs> the pain is really, really bad. It's a real pain, but it's not as bad as pain I'm feeling. I don't want anyone to go through this again. So that's why I came down. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Bob. Thank you so much. <laughs> Can't imagine what you're going through, Bob. So thank you so much for sharing that. I don't want to ignore this side of the room. I know we had, I had seen a hand earlier. Other people would like to share about their the pain that they experience and its impact right here. Hi, my name is Jason. I have K6A. Uh, my mom has K6A and so did my sister. And unfortunately, my son has it too. And uh, the question was, oh, how do we deal with the pain, right? So, uh, you know, I get up every day and I know that, like Jack said, it's a limited amount of steps. So. I drive to work, I try to let my feet air out, you know, I, I wear no socks, no shoes, I get to work. As much, I have to be on my feet, but I try to use as much brakes as I can without you know, abusing it, because I still have to do my job. On my drive home, on the same way, I take my shoes and socks off, that way my feet can air out, get a little rest. And because I know when I get home, the little guy's gonna wanna play, and he luckily right now does not have any symptoms, but uh, I know they're coming. And we know they're coming, so, you know, and this is one of those things where no matter what we do or try, the pain, you can ice, you can take Advil, Tylenol, but the pain is still going to be there. And uh, I guess I'm a knucklehead, and I just, I just try to soldier through and put, put my head down and, uh, you know, do what I do. But it's, it's not fun. It's not easy. And like everyone says, it's, uh, it's, it's mentally challenging. It's depressing at times because you can't do things. You can't go anywhere. You know, I, I refuse to miss out on family activities. You know, we were walking around yesterday, but I, I just did it. I'm paying the price now, and we're going to go walk again because I refuse to miss out. So uh, it's hard, and it's difficult at times. And, uh, yeah, so it's just it's not, it's not an easy thing to live with. So Can you help me? You know, I, th I think what you just said is really important. You talk about soldiering through, and I think that's something that we hear a lot with PC patients is, right. you know, you're, when you are doing activities, the pain is always there. And so tell me about, at least for you, you know, how do you decide um, when to soldier through versus when to take a break, you know, and does it depend on, on the day, and how does it even throughout the, the yeah, day? Yeah, it definitely depends on the day. Um, it depends, you know, obviously the mornings start off great, right, and, and the day goes, but like I said, I know my limits, what I can and can't do, so I go to work, I try to do it, try to be smart with my, uh, maybe my steps and my energy that I use, right? I'm trying to like, okay, I can do this, don't do this. Um, and then as the day goes on, you know, I, I def definitely take advantage of the breaks, my lunches, I sit down, you know, anytime I have a chance, I sit. You know, as much as sitting in traffic is terrible, it's also a relief because I'm off the feet. And then like the same thing when I get home, um, try to put some fresh, you know, socks on and maybe change to a different pair of shoes mm -hmm. to, you know, let the older ones, because our feet, like, sweat so much that our shoes, it feels like, for me, personally, like, my feet are just soaked in, like, just sweat. Mm -hmm. So I try to switch, 
and then uh, yeah, and then just you know at that point you know it's it's on the feet again. But um, like I said, mentally you ha um, everyone pushes through, and you just have to know your limits. By the end of the night, uh, I'll tell my wife, I'll say, hey, look, like I'm done. Do you need anything else? Because once I take my shoes off, like that's it. Because it's like the pressure your your shoes are holding the pressure in. But once you release that pressure, like you are done. That yeah. that is it. And and I'll tell her, I say, look, I, you need me? Tell me now. If not, I'm taking my shoes off and I'm on the couch until it's bedtime. So, uh, mm -hmm. you know, you just have to know. I, I try to make a list. Okay, this is what I have to do, and I do the things I need to do. And then at that point, the day is over for me. Sure. So, so thank, thank you. you. We'll take the comment on the far side. Hi, my name is Nancy Leachman, Dr. Leachman, I, and I'm not a PC patient, but I just felt compelled, James, mm -hmm. to bring up something that in the data that I saw that I think is inaccurate. There was something really funny, and I just don't want, want the FDA to be left with the misimpression that only 17% of the people in this room have feet problem, <laughs> because I, I think there was some kind of a problem. It was supposed to be check all that apply, yeah, yeah, and it so. wasn't check all that apply, and it, it got distributed across to a total of 100. Mm -hmm. And I think I would, I would encourage you to actually ask how many PC patients in this room don't have foot pain or don't consider that a problem, just as a yeah. raise of hands to kind of get a, a better, more accurate, valid answer for the FDA, because I think I don't want to leave them yeah. here with a misimpression on that point. Right. Yeah, so the, the counts were the more important uh, kind of number there. The percentage was distributed, uh, distributed amongst number of responses and not numbers of individuals. And what was the data? Common data? Here's the claim of the problem. Rectal and lumbar disease were common. Yeah. So Dr. Leachman is right on exactly right. Because when we add up percentage, we said how many people walk with pain, and it said 95%, and then the little thing that says it outside, the FDA did it. They got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they, they see data all day, every day. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yes. Terry, can we get a, a mic real quick? I'm, I may be the oldest PCer here. I'm 74 yeah. years old, and uh, so I've managed PC for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. and, and I just wanted to share with everyone that the key word is manage mm -hmm. for me. Mm -hmm. uh, pain is there. Everything that's been described here I've experienced. But it's a matter of planning for me. Sim something as simple as, as going to going shopping. Mm -hmm. I think about that ahead of time, and I think about where am I going to park mm -hmm. to minimize the number of steps I may have to use to get to that shop or this shop. Uh, heavily involved in, I'm a big sports fan, mm -hmm. and. Uh, my wife and I and other friends, we travel to football games, and, and but I always plan ahead about mm -hmm. how many steps am I gonna burn today? Uh, another quick observation is, mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a slight irony involved in all of this, mm -hmm. and it is that the body is actually, when the body calluses, mm -hmm. normal people callous. We just do it a lot quicker and a lot more severely. Uh, but the body's trying to tell you something. When it, mm -hmm. when it forms a callus, it's trying to protect that tissue with the callusing. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, my father was a professional baseball player, and he was a pitcher. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that was very important to him was he actually wanted to form a callus on certain of his fingers, on his pitching hand, in order to protect from blistering, mm -hmm. because a blister would put him out of business. And so a, a nice callus was a good mm -hmm. thing, not for PCers, of course, mm -hmm. but uh, so management is the key, from, has been the key for me. Mm -hmm. And I, I won't 
to make sure that all PCers understand that nobody knows PC like a PCer. Mm -hmm. We know it, okay? One of, one of my doctors complimented me some years ago, about 30 years ago, she said, um, you don't really need to spend a whole lot more time asking me about what, I should, what you should do. You're the person that knows it best. Mm -hmm. You can manage this and you should manage this. And so I've spent my entire life managing. I talked to a young couple the other, uh, last evening about, uh, and I gave them a calling card because we need to talk to each other mm -hmm. and, and uh, share our experiences and, and our successes. Mm -hmm. I've had very good success in managing my PC. Mm -hmm. I'm one of the few up there that said it's gotten better. Mm -hmm. The reason it's gotten better is not because it has genetically gotten better or medically gotten better, it's because I manage it. Mm -hmm. okay. And so if I don't use those steps during the day, my feet are less uh, traumatized. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that is worth gold. Uh, thank you for that. Thank you for sharing you. Your, your strategies as well as uh, letting us know, you know how things have gotten better for you. Um, so uh, we're gonna take a comment there, but just one thought to throw out before we go to your comment, just so other people can be prepared is, you know, we've talked a lot about the pain in walking and standing. Um, I do wanna make sure that we hear from those of you who's um, kind of most significant or maybe one of your most significant um, symptoms or burdens of PC is something other than the pain on your feet. I know we you know, had some responses that kind of indicated that. If we have anyone in the room that has that experience, you know, something else, um, whether that be uh, you know, something different than pain, like we heard on the panel itching. Uh, we also heard about cysts um, over the body. So I wanna make sure we, we get the full representative uh, PC community here today. But uh, go ahead, Todd. Sure, um, I'm Todd Wiseman. Um, I'm type 1, I'm like James, K16, the L132P mutation. Um, I'm second of three generations of PC. Um, I don't know that it was mentioned here so far, but if you have it, you have a 50% 50, 50 chance of passing it on to one of your kids. Um, Two of, two of my siblings do not have it, and one of them does. Um, one of my three birth kids has it. Um, it's very painful. I don't want to be on pain meds. Um, take them as very seldom as possible. Um, I do take a lot of Advil for the inflammation part of it. Um, I'm on gabapentin uh, or Neurontin for the, the pain piece of it as a maintenance type of drug, if you will. A lot of the drugs that I've heard other people taking are really made for other, other diseases and so forth. Um, with the gabapentin uh, or Neurontin, it kind of puts me in a cloud, so to speak. I, I don't I don't really like that feeling either, but in order to do my day-to-day -day activities, and you really have to prioritize what you're going to do, and there's a lot of things on your list that will never get done. Uh, a lot of PCers are overachievers. Um, it's very evident from all the different careers and stuff people have pursued. Um, but I want to lose a f the focus on you know, pain so much as, you know, more towards the cure and, and meds directed at specifically PC to try and help with the pain management. Um, maintaining your feet too and fingernails is a huge piece of it. I don't know if you can see, but I am right-handed. I have PC a lot more on my right hand than my left hand. I have about 90% coverage on my feet. So yeah, the, the pain piece is pretty hard. It's really hard passing it on to one of your kids too and seeing them suffer through. I know when I went to, to elementary school, you know, the physical fitness thing was huge and everyone had to run the mile, me included. Mm -hmm. And I can remember 
going home that day and really, really suffering for like a week afterwards. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, you can kind of get a doctor's note and stuff to hopefully get out of that if you have the condition and so forth. Sure. They're not so adherent on doing so, everything. So, Todd, I have a question for you. Yeah. So, uh, we haven't heard a lot about the impacts of PC on the hands. We've yeah. heard a lot about impacts on the feet. And since you mentioned you do have uh, calluses on your hands, could yeah. you, have you, has that impacted um, you and your life at all? Uh, yeah, I mean, just even like writing or using your hands, even working in the garage or something on something, by nighttime after doing a lot of hand involved wrenching or whatever, mm -hmm. your hands really suffer much like your feet would. Um, and you pay for it. Right. You know, you kind of have to pick and choose what you do. Sure. Um, I, I have knee pads. I'll crawl around the house at night, try to save my feet for the next day. Uh, you learn to adapt and do things quite a bit differently. Yes. Um, I'll sit or kneel to do things that, you know, most people would maybe stand to sure. do. Standing in line at the airport, walking, taking your shoes off mm -hmm. and walking through the uh, scanners and stuff is horrible. I mean, it's it's like walking on glass, quite mm -hmm. literally. Wow. So. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. But uh, that, Thank that's you. about all I have. I'm a public servant, like you folks at the FDA. I do IT for the state of Minnesota, so it, it, it's uh, great that you're all here today and, and listening to our stories and yes. learning uh, a little more about how we deal with PC on a day-to-day -day basis. Thank you. Yes, and thank you, Todd. Um, <laughs> so do we have any takers that want to talk about symptoms beyond the foot pain? Hi, my name is Beth Martz. I have K-17. Um, it's been in my family for about a billion years, um, since the dawn of time. So we've been dealing with this for a long time, and one of our um, symptoms that are big, bigger issues are the cysts. So I just want to explain kind of like a little bit about those. Mm -hmm. They're everywhere. I have them um, in the skin on my toes and in my scalp. Um, and what happens is they can just be dormant or they become inflamed and erupt into boils and can cause extensive scarring. <clears throat> Excuse me, I don't know why I feel nervous. Look at friendly face. I just feel a little. Um, so they can cause extensive scarring and like when you hit puberty, um, I think my chest looked almost like it was burned in a fire, mm -hmm. kind of very extreme scarring. Probably a lot of you can relate to that. And um, also just other misunderstandings in the medical community. I made it all the way to a breast surgeon who thought I had a breast tumor, but it was just a big cyst. So that's a lot of time and a lot of money sort of wasted on yeah. false diagnosis. And how have, you know, when you do have the cysts and, or the periods of time where you had more cysts, um, how did that impact your, your daily life? Um, it can be completely debilitating. It depends on lo location. I've missed, mm -hmm a lot of work, um, usually without explanation. Mm -hmm. um, you can't, it, it limits mobility. It just yeah. depends on the location, but it is extremely one. painful, and it's rarely just one. It's mm -hmm. usually a couple at a time. Sure. Thank you, Beth. Sure, yeah. Okay, anyone else on symptoms outside of foot pain? Hand involvement, cysts, something different besides the pain itself, such as the itch? We have a couple hands over here. I'm Diane Butler and I have um, K-16. And um, I go to doctors that don't have any idea what I'm dealing with. Like I've wasted money on, um, like one time I went to the dentist and my tongue was all white oh, you have to go to the oral surgeon right away, get right in. And, but by the time I get to the oral surgeon, have the appointment, blah, 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 well, it's gone. So I spent, you know, $350 on nothing. And um, I don't know when it's gonna be there. And the dentist, 
I go and he like checks my tongue and I feel like I'm a guinea pig, which is fine because I would like to find something for my kids and grandkids. But um, I mean, it is funny when they don't have any idea, like Mayo Clinic, no idea at all. Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes I don't even know what it is. It's like, mm -hmm. well, it's just painful. Like I'll get sores in there in my mouth um, besides all the foot things and yeah. all that. But that's, that's to me is kind of weird because you, you think it's bad enough that your feet hurt, but now you have these sores in your mouth as well. And how so. long do those usually last when they do come? I don't know. They just assume sometimes a week or two. Okay. Like right now, I have a sore in there. But I don't know if what's normal because I don't know. Maybe people don't get that, but yeah. I, we do. I don't know. Okay. So that's our no, That's our normal. Right. So. Thank you, Diane. I think we had another hand, and then we'll come to Roxy. Um, Roxy and I have K6A. Um, I actually want to join in on that um, with the mouth. I actually don't ever not have whitening of the tongue. So a lot of times the sides of my interior of my, my, my mouth are like scalloped because I'm chewing on them inadvertently, especially in the middle of the night. It just gets worse. Um, and that affects like how I talk sometimes or I don't talk because it's like thick and just and it's hard to eat sometimes too because you're chewing and you're like, oh, I'm not chewing food. Um, and that is painful because you're chewing on your tongue or you like slice off some. Um, the other thing is I do have nail issues and I can actually feel my nails growing sometimes. So in the middle of the night, like I, they're throbbing like all my nails and I try to like elevate my arms or my hands, um, but like, I wear nail polish so I can see like a millimeter of growth sometimes or more um, just within a day or two. And so those pains, like you use your hands a lot. Like think about when you like put on nail polish as women, like you literally have to wait and like let them dry. And so you can't do anything like button a shirt or pull up your pants or open a door or anything like that. And that's how it feels, but it's with pain and um, Sometimes it goes away and sometimes it can wake me up or I can, you know, I have to go home from work. Luckily, I do a lot of drawing with like a, a computer pen. So I don't have to like type or do anything that involves actually like using my fingernails. Um, but that, those two pains are a reality each day for myself. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. So. Um, that's all the time we have for our topic one discussion. Um, that being said, we have another discussion coming up on uh, approaches to treating, including you know, strategies for managing uh, different products that you might take to help treat it, and your approaches to foot care. And of course, all of those are directly related to the symptoms and burdens you're trying to treat. Um, so if you didn't have a chance to talk this first session, um, please chime in at the next session, and we'd love to hear from you. Uh, we're going to take a 10 minute break and then we're going to come back for topic two.
Calling Andrew, Smiley Riley, and Jan up to the stage. I was just trying to be fair, not call Andrew out. <laughs> Thanks. Riley, you look cute. Thank you. I got, today. I got a chip, chip already on my dress, so. You got what? Yeah, I have chips. Okay. Oh. I know what it's <laughs> <laughs> oh, I went, okay. I'm pretty close to Oh, well, that actually is how it all is displayed. My husband's it watching the web well, thing. Well, but well, but well, make sure that you're speaking into the mic exactly because some of them couldn't be heard. So make sure All right, so for topic two, we're going to explore current and future treatments for PC. Uh, so we're going to build on our uh, earlier discussion of all of the symptoms uh, and burdens on your daily life. And we are going to um, explore how you try to manage that, whether that be through um, medical treatments, you know, self-care, or even just lifestyle modifications. Um, and so we're going to ask you questions about what you're currently doing, how well it's working, what are the downsides of those things, and then ultimately, um, wh what are the gaps and what is it that you would like to see from a future treatment? Uh, so to kick off our conversation uh, about this important topic, uh, we have another all-star panel for you. We have Andrew Butler, Julianne Bennett, Roseanne McGrath, Austin Pinardo, Riley Dippenbaugh, and Janice Schwartz. Andrew, kick it off. My name is Andrew Butler. I am 40 years old. I have a K16 gene mutation, and honestly, I am a miserable human being. I am a father of three, and thank God only one of my children, my eight-year-old Brayden, has PC. My entire life revolves around my feet. Absolutely everything from the socks I wear to trying to find shoes that won't kill me, to finding a parking spot on a family outing, then I have to decide if I will go inside or just wait in the car because I'm in too much pain. Even my profession revolves around my feet. I started my own trucking company in 2005 so I could get off my feet and try to make a living. The biggest thing I deal with every day is ridiculous, overwhelming, debilitating pain. Just the thought of walking in a mall or going shopping causes me stress. Yard work, mowing the lawn, hell no. I'll let the lawn die before I'll walk on the grass. This pushes my responsibilities onto my wife and my family. To make it perfectly clear, I'm always in pain and I'm always miserable. The two most important things I do to treat my condition are foot maintenance, which is the shaving and trimming of the calluses and taking several prescription medications. I need to shave off my calluses every two to three weeks where I can literally remove up to a half of a pound of callus. I soak my feet for about an hour in hot soapy water to soften them up and then use an old 60s style double edged razor blade shaver to cut off the calluses. This is very effective and mandatory for me, but can cause cuts and nicks and severely increase the pain the day afterwards. My history with pain medication has changed throughout the years. In my teens, I took large amounts of Advil, up to 20 tablets per day. When I learned about Aleve's, I took three to six tablets every day. All through my 20s and up until 2010, I used narcotic painkillers. Anything left over from my family and friends who knew nothing about my condition other than I hurt constantly. Friends could see by the way I walked and acted that I was suffering. I lived in fear of being caught with prescriptions that were not mine. It was not until 2010 that I was finally diagnosed with PC. Shortly after, I met a great pain management doctor who, because of the vast information on the PC Project website, understood the amount of pain I was in. This was the first time in my life I had a doctor sincerely try to understand what I was going through. 
he prescribed me 15 milligrams of meloxicam and 50 milligrams of tramadol every single day. I take them before I even get out of bed and can't imagine living without them. He also prescribed me 120 10 milligram tablets of oxycodone per month to use as needed. I'm ashamed about this at times because of all the bad things in the news and about prescription drug use and the stigma that comes with it. I feel the treatment that I use is the best I can do for now, although there is nothing that can be done to stop or slow the progression of my disease. The treatment I am using helps me to do the most with the cards that I have been dealt. I think of oxycodone as my ace up my sleeve. I only use it when I really need to use my feet for a lot of walking, especially for playing with my kids. A huge downside of using oxycodone is that it, because of the, it masks the pain, I can pay dearly with even more intense pain later in the day and the next day even once all the pain medication wears off. Another downside to the oxycodone is I have to choose between being in excruciating pain but completely present or due to oxycodone side effects, feel dopey and not totally present. Memory loss is also a real issue. There are entire conversations I cannot recall. Another problem I have with my medication is in my professional life. I own a small trucking company with five trucks and I'm also a driver. I have to choose between working with lots of pain or using my medicine while operating a commercial vehicle. Neither of these choices are acceptable. When the pain gets bad enough, I risk losing my license and possibly my business if I take my medicine. This is a struggle that I deal with every day. As for my eight-year-old son, Braden, with PC, I lay awake at night worrying about him. <coughs> How many more good years will he get? How long until my son will be miserable like me? What will I do for him? Pain medications? Oxycodone? I pray to God there's a better answer. There has to be. I just cannot accept all the pain and painkillers for his future. I know there is currently no treatments and no cure for my condition. All I can do is cope with the symptoms. I can't imagine sleeping, hiking with my own kids, or even doing any normal everyday activity without wondering, can I do it? Can I make it? How far do I have to go? I really wish there were other forms of pain management that didn't require me to take painkillers, but would give me the same or better relief. Thank you very much for taking the time to listen to me today. My name is Julie Bennett. I was diagnosed at age 27 as PCK16, but my family can trace our PC back at least six generations. For my entire life, I've watched as my great-grandmother, grandmother, mother, and now my son each have struggled to live as normal a life as possible while dealing with chronic, intense pain every single step of the way. PC affects my life in so many ways, it's difficult to spend a few mi minutes explaining those, that, that impact. Beginning the moment I wake up, I reach for my memory foam slippers before I can roll out of bed to make it across a carpeted floor to the bathroom. I'm fortunate because my shower floor is smooth and, I, and my pain level still allows me to take a daily shower. My mom can't tolerate the pan, pain of standing for even a few seconds, so she must bathe and never shower. Every morning, as soon as I'm awake, I start my day by taking two Excedrin or two to three ibuprofen to try to get ahead of the pain that will inevitably be part of my day. I typically take three to four doses of Excedrin in a day, but on long days, like today, I alternate between Excedrin and ibuprofen all day long to manage the pain. Evenings at home are spent with my shoes off, slippers on, and feet elevated to try to recover from what most people would consider a very minimal number of steps each day. On a weekly basis, I spend 15 to 30 minutes of my morning using a surgical scalpel and another, a, a number of other tools on my softened calluses. I try to keep them trimmed to just the right density. If they're too thin, they'll bleed. 
If they're too thick, it still feels like walking on rocks. Regardless of how diligent I am with trimming the calluses that covers most of my foot, the pain with every single step persists. My closet is filled with dozens of shoes. I don't have a shoe fetish. My shoes are not fashionable. Each and every pair of my shoes is carefully selected with the hope that they might be comfortable enough to take the steps required in a given day. Something as simple as buying a new pair of athletic shoes or slippers can take months of shopping, purchasing, trying, returning. It's a rare day when I find a pair of shoes that seems comfortable enough to tolerate wearing all day. Very few of the dozens of shoes I buy are actually tolerable all day. Packing for even a brief trip like today when I'm in DC for 24 hours required four pairs of shoes and a pair of slippers because I'm never quite sure which pair of shoes might work today. Regardless of the comfort of my ugly shoes, too many steps will mean I will not be able to walk at the end of the day, or I may pay the price for several days to come. Business networking and social events are particularly painful, both psychologically and physically. Standing to talk to people, often on a hard floor service for an hour or more, will inevitably result in tremendous pain, then a sleepless night, as my feet throb with pain and jab, punishing me for mistreating them. Sometimes Advil PM works, other times it simply doesn't. I have a wonderful husband and co-workers who are acutely aware of my pain. They drop me at the entrance, fetch me food and drink, move conversations to softer carpeted areas, pull up a bar stool, bring me the car. I hate feeling like an invalid. Every step I take has to be accommodated. One of my three children inherited PC. Tate's a high school senior this year. Nearly every decision to participate in activities or make life choices is driven by his PC foot pain. During Tate's senior trip to the Smoky Mountains this spring, we came up with a reason for me to pick him up on the day of the all-day hike. <coughs> that way, he wouldn't have to hike and experience debilitating pain the rest of the week, nor would he be humiliated by needing to stay behind from the group and be questioned and treated differently. As we visit college campuses, our decision can't be based only on the ranking or academics of an institution. Instead, we must evaluate the steps required to get to the shower in the dorm, to get to class, and we must evaluate access to different modes of transportation. Is it possible to drive and park near class? On this campus, would a bike, a scooter, a skateboard even be allowed? For six generations, my family has based our lives on the steps required to try to minimize the intense pain. I lead a fulfilling life. I have a wonderful family, a rewarding career, extensive international travel. I do not let PC pain stop me. I manage the pain with routine care and lots of Excedrin and ibuprofen, but I cannot live what most people call a normal life. Additionally, I know as I age, my pain will continue to increase. My mom now trims her calluses every day or two, and she can rarely find a pair of shoes or slippers that are tolerable. I cared for my grandmother's PC as she was aging, and I watched her pain progress. I know that she could no longer walk outside of her home without the use of a wheelchair because the pain was just too great. I hope a treatment will come that may enable me to work for a full day without debilitating pain that affects me for days to come. I, increasing the number of steps or hours of standing I could tolerate would be a tremendous accomplishment. I hope that someday my son will be able to enjoy an all-day hike. At a minimum, I hope he might be able to walk from his dorm or apartment across his college campus without concern for how many steps it takes. Maybe someday my son and I will be able to dance at his wedding without unbearable pain. I hope my future grandchildren will have a treatment that enables them to live their life without minimizing their steps and being limited in the activities they can enjoy. That would be a true miracle, and one that the scientists and the FDA in this room might be able to make a reality. Thank you for allowing me to share my story. Good morning. My name is Roseanne McGrath. It is truly an honor and a privilege to speak to you today. Although I don't think I'm going to say anything that you probably already haven't heard, um, but I reside with my incredible husband in the suburbs of Philadelphia. I'm a spontaneous K6A mutation. I was uh, presented, the PC presented at birth. I was actually diagnosed in Philadelphia shortly after I was born. 
The fact that I'm spontaneous is really a paradox because as you heard, I think from Terry, every blessed thing we do, we have to mind map and pre-plan. So I can minimize my every step, minimize the pain, hide my limp, as you heard from Jack earlier, we've coined it the PC walk, or as I call it, the walk of shame. The best way I can describe living life with PC is like a fuel tank that is always on E for empty. Praying not for another mile, because we can certainly not walk a mile, but praying I can make just a few mere more steps each day. <coughs> because the debilitating pain doesn't have you running on empty, it's got you struggling to barely get by on fumes. You've already heard, PC is really very simple. It's all about pain. You must be thinking, can skin really cause this much pain? Yes, because skin is our largest organ. Appearance and care is so important, but it's the excruciating, debilitating, chronic pain that rules our existence. We need relief from this pain. I try to appear normal, but the truth be told, as you heard probably from Andy, we're cranky and we're suffering from sheer, utter exhaustion. Every minute of every day, while awake or asleep, and try to sleep, because sleep and the mattress and the mere sh touch of the sheets are just torture. Since the age of four, I have had a physician use a scalpel to debris my hands and feet. My hands are affected just as well as my feet uh, every other week. As I got older and into my 20s, the weeping, blistering blisters changed into smaller calluses where actually, as you heard from others, the blood vessels uh, present through our nerves and through our cracks and fissures. I use a Dremel drill every other day on my nails so they can appear normal, uh, but the nerves grow up through the nails, so that's very painful. I have a special blade that I use to excise the cysts that grow on my back and groin and scar our bodies, as you've heard from before. I actually look like I have a railroad going through my groin and backside area. If I don't debris my hands and feet regularly, I simply can't exist. As I think you heard from Jamie, our balance is off. I have fallen four times and broken the bones in each of my feet and been diagnosed with osteoporosis. What is further gut-wrenching that you've already heard is the emotional torture of being shunned and made fun of and bullied while growing up which I can now say makes us actually stronger, more caring, more sensitive, but I wasn't thinking that at the time that I attempted to end my life as a teenager. Although blessed because PC is not life-threatening, as a 51-year-old adult, I actually pray to the dear sweet Lord that he would take me over someone else sooner than later, because then I could fulfill my dream of being an angel without PC on my wings, where I could fly. I wouldn't have to sit, stand, crawl, use my cane, use my wheelchair. I'd also be remiss not to mention the torture I went through deciding whether I should have my own children or not. I have no regrets, I decided not to, but it leaves a void. But the good Lord blessed me with two beautiful stepdaughters and now a beautiful grandson. <coughs> so I just wanna paint an, anima an animation for you. An angel on one shoulder, and a devil on the other. That depicts inner turmoil, emotional turmoil. On the one shoulder is, I think what everybody may call me, effervescent, angelic Roseanne, always happy, a successful human resources professional for 30 years. I always tout PC is a condition I have. It's part of my life. I won't let it define me. It's all about perspective. I have the most incredible parents that have always kept me focused and always told me, it's not what you can't do, it's your mission to focus on what you can do. Because can't means won't. Growing up, I've always said, no pain, no gain. Mind over matter. God gives you lemons, make lemonade. But embarrassingly, it's the demonic side where I have to put vodka in my lemonade to survive. I eat Advil like candy every four hours. I take Lyrica. I take opioid pain medication, and this is only to be a productive, functional human being of society. The angelic Roseanne always says that the glass is half full, there's far worse things in life, but my glass is full of alcohol, and I'm screaming enough is enough. God only knows what my liver and kidneys look like. As a seasoned HR professional, I'm described as a tough cookie with a heart of gold, but the truth be told, I'm a crumbling cookie. I had to recently retire from a position I loved and held for 23 years. My motto is fake it until you make it. I couldn't make it anymore. I try to not allow PC to interfere or limit me, 
but to motivate me. I try to keep a positive attitude and persevere because people really are my passion. But the pain of pachynechia congenita rules my life. It makes me pissy, pissed off, sharp-tongued. I know there's no cure in my lifetime, but an effective treatment would be an answer to my prayers and not that prayer for death. You've asked earlier about risk. I'll take all the risk in the world. What level of activity would be meaningful? What would be meaningful is to not have to pretend I'm normal, but to actually be normal. To not live in constant, agonizing, physical, mental, and emotional torture 24-7. To not live every moment awake or asleep in excruciating agony while trying to be a productive member of society. To be able to do the things that the average person takes for granted, like standing in the shower, walking on a beach, going in the ocean, to not feel like such a burden to those I love and who love me, to no longer have to use a cane or a wheelchair, to not have to crawl, to be able to sleep, to not take pain medication and drink, and simply state it, just to have a better quality of life. So I thank you, the FDA, for working with all of those who are researching to find effective treatments, relief, and a cure that will not only help me, but those that are suffering from other debilitating conditions. Good morning, my name is Austin Pinardo, and I am a 21-year-old senior at Marshall University, and I start my graduate program in physical therapy in May. Originally, I'm from Shady Spring, West Virginia, but uh, while I'm at school at Marshall, I live in Huntington, West Virginia, uh, while attending uh, Marshall University. But I am a diagnosed K6A patient who has been struggling with PC since I was nine months old. My symptoms I experience are the thickened nails, blistering and calluses on my feet, follicular hyperkeratosis, and leukokeratosis. My doctor I've been going to since I was 18 months old from Duke has always tried to find more medicines for me to try just to see if my condition would lessen. Mainly the only area of my disorder my treatment usually focuses on is the blistering and calluses and the pain that are caused by them on my feet. I will admit that in my entire life I've never had a medicine that lessened the pain. And since I was younger I've always been on some form of lotion medication that I would put on my feet daily. On the other end, I do try to stay away from pain medications as much as possible. I am prescribed hydrocodones to cope with the everyday pain, but I only take them when I'm in the absolute worst pain, either after I dare to do a sporting event or if I have long day walks at the mall. I try to take non-prescription painkillers, making my normal week consist of taking a few Aleve leave here and there in total throughout the week, but the amount varies depending on the activity level for that week. As I grow older, my medications went more experimental and I started taking pills or using lotions that were meant for other f disorders. <clears throat> One example of that was when I was prescribed lovastatin. Statins are used for managing one's cholesterol, although the other effects of the drugs had a possibility of helping out dry my feet. This had the possibility of reducing the blisters or reducing the calluses by drying them out. But I had no luck on reducing my pain or the blistering and calluses but my doctor focused still mainly on drying out my feet. But the only bad thing about drying the feet out is the pain goes, stay, stays on the calluses and then you're added pain with your skin cracking and breaking open. As of today, I'm currently not taking any specific medication for my disease. The only care I do for my feet is by cutting the calluses down about every week. I have to make sure to cut them down evenly or they become un uneven and the pain ends up increasing. The blisters grow back pretty quickly, so if you do not keep up with maintaining them, they can end up becoming worse. I haven't been on medication recently because my doctor is still researching possible treatments that we have not tried yet. Everything we try, I have a moment of relief, hoping only for, <clears throat> hoping for a good outcome, but in the end, we are back to square one and my pain has not changed. The only form of treatment that I currently partake in is soaking my feet in hot water and Dama Bro. It does not do anything other than relax my feet when they're in severe pain, but I still do it just for that little bit of time that I have without as much pain. I do not know the real reasoning as to why Domabro seems to help, but I believe soaking my feet in general tends to reduce the swelling I have. 
No treatment is shown to stop the progression of my disease, although some people have improvements by using certain medications. Sometimes I believe that, it, that the disease adapts to the medicines that relieve some of the symptoms, but in the end, I admit that my mind just hoped for too much for improvement. I do want to point out that because of the thickened nails I suffer from, I did have my fingernails removed during my transition from elementary school to middle school. Not that many people have done this, but I highly recommend it. The problems my nails used to cause me were tremendous. Without them, I feel so much more confident in public, and my hands look somewhat normal. Before the surgery, my nails would be in pain, and I could not completely touch my fingers together. They seemed to just get in the way in almost everything I did. The only problem I had from getting them removed was while I was still in recovery. The problem was when I started, first started middle school. It was a rough time for me since I started my first day with both hands still bandaged up like boxing gloves. One kid took this to heart and would never let it go that there was something wrong with me. He was a bully to most of the kids at the school, but that year he decided to take a big interest in me. My hands were still recovering and my bandages were cut down to smaller ones at this point, but the kid decided that he wanted to see if I was in pain. He chose to hit my hands every chance he got, not only causing me loads of pain, but in the end causing my grafts to be messed up and some of the nails grew back. If I was to go back and get to do it over again, I would still have the surgery done because my life has changed tremendously since my nails were removed. Although I cannot pick up a dime off the ground because of my lack of nails, I think the more important aspects outweigh the bad of not having what I used to have. To choose between the many symptoms I have, I believe I wouldn't be the only one who wishes for only the pain to stop. By now I've accepted that a cure may not be found during my life, but in, in, a, in my opinion, I have learned to live with my disorder. The only aspect that I cannot fully live with is the pain that I endure daily. If I had to choose for one symptom to be treated, I would choose to eliminate or lessen the pain that I have. The visual aspects of my disorder do not matter to me anymore. I just want to be able to run or to play sports or exercise. Simply being able to walk around my school and enjoy the campus more would make my life a lot more enjoyable. I used to play sports when I was younger, even though my mom would carry a medical kit with her to manage my blisters as they got worse. If I could even walk enough to stay in the shape and lose weight, I think that would be a victory. If there's anything that can be done about my pain, I want it to be done. Thank you for listening, and I hope that one day we can have a cure, but until then, I will live on one step at a time. Hello, my name is Riley. I'm 18 years old, and I'm a senior in high school, and I'm a spontaneous mutation of PCK6A. Everything I do to manage my PC has to deal with the treating the pain in my feet. One thing I do is try to keep my feet in a balance between wet and dry. I leave my socks and my shoes on a lot to keep my feet from drying out. If my feet get too dry, they hurt more. The calluses get hard and like rocks and they hurt super badly. They will crack and they will bleed. The worst is when they have to stick to my socks. I'll have to put them in water, <coughs> socks and all, in order to peel them off. So I try to keep my feet not too dry. I regularly soak my feet in plain water. Soaking helps. It feels good and is very soothing. It also helps them not to itch. The itch is so bad, I'll scratch them until they bleed. I just can't seem to get the itch, no matter how hard I scratch. To get the itch, I'll have to rub my sock against my foot. It will rub my skin off because I don't have good nails for itching. I'll have to use my sock, the floor, or even a back scratcher. I never take my socks off. It's more comfortable to have my socks and my shoes on. Still, it's a hard balance when my feet are wet and blistery. They hurt when they are dry, and they hurt when they're wet. It's a lose-lose situation. The worst thing about PC are the blisters and calluses. For every symptom I have, the pain and the itching is from the blisters and calluses. I have to pop the blisters all the time. Sometimes I just squeeze the blisters with my fingers and they will pop, or I use needles. My mom used to cut the, my calluses down with razor blades until I was about nine or 10. She used to cut so close to the skin they would bleed. I used to have to put Band-Aids on my feet every single day on every single one of my calluses. But at, the, at some point, they change from solid calluses to blisters where I can't even touch them. My calluses don't grow up. They just stay flat. I used to be able to walk without shoes, but once my feet changed, I couldn't do that anymore. I was on the high school swim team my freshman, sophomore, and junior year. Then they just hurt too bad to do it anymore. Walking around the pool was sore, but also the water went against my calluses, so that hurt too. Last year, I started taking tramadol. I take pain medicine each morning in order to go to school. The medicine takes the edge off. It also takes the throbbing and the sharp pain away. The hurt doesn't go away, but I can stand up more. 
I am very social. I like to be out and about. The medicine makes me very tired, but the pain also makes me tired. So it's hard to tell which one makes me the most tired. I use the medicine to help me get through school without crutches or wheelchair. But I do use my wheelchair every time I go to the mall, grocery store, concerts, or on vacation. My family needs me to go on vacation with them so we can use my wheelchair and I'm their line cutter. None of these things, the medicine, the soaking, really stop the pain or how my calluses grow. The only thing that helps stop the pain is to limit my walking. Staying off my feet is the only thing I can do. I made my school schedule so all my classes are close together. I don't eat in the lunchroom because it's so far away. I'll bring my own lunch and eat in the library because it's closer to where my classes are. I also have a handicap placard from my car and I use it at school every day. In junior high, I walked a lot. I just can't do that anymore. The pain in my feet hurts my whole entire body. When I stand up or walk too long, I feel like I'm going to pass out. I can only walk for about 10 minutes before my body starts to shut down. My legs will go all red and purple and I will have to sit down. I'll even throw up sometimes because of the pain. Another way I manage my PC is by crawling. When I come home at school at the end of the day, I usually park my car in the driveway, call from my car to my house because my feet hurt so badly. Inside my home, I'll crawl 24 seven. The only bad thing about crawling is it bruises my knees. I get to the point where my knees hurt so bad I couldn't even bend them. If there was no cure for PC, I would at least want a treatment that would give me less pain. Everything starts with the pain. I can't walk without my shoes because of the pain. I wouldn't crawl if I didn't have the pain. I would like a treatment that would let me walk a lot longer. Like I wish I could take my dog on a walk. I love to be able to walk at the mall or go to a concert. I would love to walk on the beach without dying. I would love to be able to have a typical teenage job and do what most people do my age. The most simple things to other people are the hardest thing in the world for me. Since I'm always in a good mood, people call me Smiley Riley. There's no point in being a negative person because I have a disease that is so rare. My dad will always say, you're going to win the lottery. But for me, if there's a good treatment out there that would make it so I don't have as much pain that I could stand or walk, that would be like winning the lottery. I'm Jan, again. I'm 49 years old and I have a spontaneous mutation of the K6A gene. Two of my four children have PC. Those two boys are now ages 23 and 21. For me and for my boys, the worst part of PC is the debilitating pain from the calluses on the bottoms of my feet. Because there are, no currently, there are no, currently no effective treatments for PC, I simply try to manage the pain each day. I take ibuprofen several times a week, especially when I have activities that I don't want to be blinded by pain for, like going to the store or maybe to one of my children's school functions or a sports event for one of my kids, the kids that don't have PC. However, however over-the-counter ibuprofen simply dulls the pain for a short while. The trauma from having socks and shoes on too long or from standing on my feet still occurs, and I pay for those choices later with increased pain. Lately, I've been taking Motrin PM more often at bedtime in order to sleep. Otherwise, I'll wake up throughout the night from either pain or itching in my feet or both. And by the way, last night, the Motrin PM did not work. I often apply an ointment with benzocaine on the calluses that have those neurovascular structures growing in them. The benzocaine will somewhat temporarily numb the bloody endings that stick out so I can put on my socks and so that I can bear the sharp, stinging, pulsating pain, which is pretty much constant whether I'm on my feet or not. On any given day, I rotate between walking with crutches, using a wheelchair, or crawling to avoid putting my pressure on my feet, like Riley. I also shave my calluses down as needed, maybe once a week, with a pet egg or a razor blade, but even that is difficult with those bloody endings sticking out, with their ner these bloody nerve endings sticking out. Mostly, I manage my pain by managing my activities. I try to choose what activities are most important each day with the limited amount of time I can bear on my feet. And I confess, I manage a lot with the help of others. For example, my good husband does the grocery shopping and the yard work. He runs a lot of errands for me. He probably hears all the time, honey, can you do a little favor for me, please? <laughs> I think that is probably the most common line of our marriage. Anyway, I used to be embarrassed about using mobility aids or needing help. But now I just try to be gracious and grateful. I try to never take advantage of the people who help me, but I am very thankful for that. 
In the quest for an effective treatment, I've tried to help when needed. For example, I've lost count of the number of skin biopsies I've given over the years, including ones out of my PC calluses. And I will tell you, a callus or a biopsy punch out of the skin is not a problem. It's just a simple punch and a few stitches, not a problem. Out of the callus with PC, it's a different story. I have been named, I have been involved rather, in numerous studies, too many to name here, so I'll tell you about two. The first was a phase 1B study for topical rapamycin, and the picture you're seeing right there is not it, um, it's, and it happened at Stanford, and I applied the treatment on my foot calluses. Along with 14 other patients, I flew to California for my regular appointments. I experienced some relief from my pain, but not a great enough amount to stop walking with crutches. I still have hope for a topical product that would reduce the pain enough to walk on my own for a significant amount of time. And I'm actually thrilled that a company has stepped up to carry this drug, this rapamycin drug forward and be more effective than it was in, that, in the Stanford trial. I was also the one patient in an FDA approved phase one clinical trial for, for siRNA. That particular treatment for me showed the most visible improvement I've ever seen with a callus in a callus. I saw the callus at the treated site pull off like Velcro and in a nice spot of beautiful pink skin formed in one small area. The rest of the foot still had painful calluses where it was not treated. I would have liked to have seen what more of that treatment could do to my entire foot. However, I didn't especially enjoy the manner it was delivered. And that was the last picture <laughs> that you saw because the treatment involved injections into my PC callus in both be twice a week for 17 weeks. I will tell you the injections were horrific. <laughs> I needed to mentally and physically gear up for them and they kept me incapacitated for two days a week. A shot in the foot is not a big deal. A shot in my PC callus is an indescribably painful experience. I'm still hoping for a more tolerable de delivery method for that treatment as well and really hope that the company that is trying to do this is successful. That was a pretty amazing thing. Thus, I've been in two major trials with treatments that show promise, but in very different ways. I remember watching a presentation a number of years ago by one of the scientists who discovered the PC gene. His name is Professor Erwin McLean. He showed a picture of a mountaintop with many pathways to get to the top. He compared the top of that mountain to effective treatments or a cure and pointed out that there were many pathways possible. And I thought about that because of my two experiences. There's a possibility of many pathways that might help our PC. And what would that PC, what would that top of that mountain look like for me? Um, short of a cure, what I really wish more than anything is that my two sons with PC could come home to visit without needing to scoot around the kitchen on an office chair with wheels. I wish they could come home to visit without sinking at the door once they got in with pain to their knees. I wish they could get around their college campuses without fear their bikes will get a flat tire. I'm the mom, I, I, mandatory family pictures. I wish we could have a family picture, an outside family picture without excruciating pain. You see the smiles up on that picture. You don't know how bad it was getting across that grass for those boys that are, hmm. <laughs> we really are happy, but that was a painful picture. <laughs> anyway, I wish they could do all the activities they've ever sat out of because of pain. And the truth is, I would like a treatment that reduces pain and increases mobility for every PC patient. Every single patient in this room right here has a confirmed genetic, muta genetic mutation, and they're here because they want to help. These people are my family, and I would love a treatment for their pain, for all the other patients that are watching out there, and for all the patients that are not watching out there, as much as I would ever want one for my two boys with PC. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your very personal stories and your own thoughts and insights into where we might go from here. I think that's an important aspect of this second part of our discussion is, you know, we're moving beyond just sharing the, uh, the present, but we're moving into the future and, and what it is that, you know, really would be, um, you know, beneficial for you from future treatments. I think that's really the, the ultimate goal of what we're working towards. Um, so in that light, we're going to, again, move uh, to broaden the discussion to all of you here in the room and on the webcast. Um, we're gonna, this is our third and final set of polling questions, and these are related to managing PC and future treatments. Uh, so if we can have our first polling question. So this question is, 
what are you or the person you care for currently doing to manage your PC? And for this question, please check all that apply. Your options are A, trim or cut off calluses, B, cut, sand, or trim nails, C, take over-the-counter pain medicine, D, take prescription pain medicine, E, lance, drain, inject, or remove cysts, F, apply ointments or creams to affected areas, G, pop blisters, H, wear special socks, insoles, or shoes, or I, other. Again, please check all that apply to you. It's not letting us check all that apply. Oh, you can only check one. Um, all right, well, I, I don't know that, uh, oh, Brett's Hang saying on, we can waiting. adjust that. Okay. So one second. Okay. <laughs> Go for it, Brett. Save us. Now you may, once we get this fixed, have to exit the question and go back in. We'll let you know when to do so. Yes. Should we be good? Okay, if everyone can exit out and enter, enter uh, question one again, uh, you should be able to now check that all apply. Can I get a thumbs up if someone's able to check? No, not yet. Oh, we have a thumbs up, so keep trying. You should be able to exit out and go back in. Oh, close the app and reopen it, and that works. Okay. Well, it's working. Is everybody getting it to work? Mm -hmm. Awesome. So go all the way out of the app and then go back in. Okay. So those, if you're able to, uh, those of you on the web that are, are following along, we seem to have uh, corrected it so you can now select all that apply. You just need to, if you were in the app, close out of the app and open it back up and the question should be fixed. Um, please check all that apply. And just keep in mind the percentages that are displaying are the percentage of responses, not the percentage of people um, when it's a check all that apply question. So um, if you want to see the relative kind of weight, just we can look at the bars and uh, ignore kind of the percentages, uh, since that's the percent of responses, not the percentage of people. Okay. So, um, of what everyone does to currently manage their PC, um, it seems that the most common strategies are to uh, trim and cut off calluses, cut sand and trim nails, and wearing special socks uh, insoles or shoes. Um, it does look like we have uh, a number of people that have uh, also take over-the-counter pain medicine, apply ointments and pop blisters, uh, a lesser amount take prescription pain medicine, um, or need to lance drain or uh, inject or remove cysts. And then there are some of you that do something else not listed, so we will definitely explore that in the discussion. Can we move to the second question? So our second question is, how satisfied are you with the current treatments available today for your PC? So the things that you just responded to in the first question, how satisfied are you? Your options are A, highly satisfied, where current treatments allow you to live a life with no limitations. B, satisfied, current treatments allow you to live a life with only a few limitations. C, you're unsatisfied, or even with current treatments, you're living a life with many limitations. Or D, very unsatisfied, current treatments are unsatisfactory and do little to help you overcome the everyday disease burden. So please select that which applies to you. How satisfied are you with 
what you currently have available to treat your PC. I'll give you another moment to get your responses in. Okay, so the majority uh, of you are very unsatisfied with your current uh, treatments. Um, they do very little to help you. Um, you know, uh, uh, over a third of you, however, are um, unsatisfied, meaning that you uh, live life with many limitations. Um, and then there are some of you, uh, either in the room or online, that are satisfied with what you currently have, but nobody is highly satisfied. Can we move to the third question? So this question is, have you ever utilized a mobility assistance device, uh, which that could include a wheelchair, cane, scooter, or a walker, or have you employed an alternative form of mobility, such as using bikes, strollers, crawling, holding onto walls or rails, piggybacking, or even holding onto another person because of your PC? Um, and your options are yes, A, yes, uh, at, some, at some point during every day, B, yes, not every day, but at least once or more during the week. C, yes, on some occasions, but not every week. Or D, no, you never uh, need a mobility assistance device or need to employ some kind of alternative form of mobility because of your PC. Just one more moment to respond to this. It's looking like uh, a pretty fair spread here. Um, between uh, a third and a, a half of you almost uh, are at some point every day um, either utilizing a mobility assistance device or using some alternative form of mobility. Um, about a, almost a third of you uh, do so, but only on occasion, so not every week. Uh, One-fifth of you almost uh, are doing so weekly, and then uh, almost 15% of you uh, never need to do uh, one of these things. Okay, so can we go to our fourth question? Um, so now we're going to start looking and talking about um, future uh, treatment and what you might be looking for. So this question is, in the absence of a cure, a clinically meaningful treatment for PC would, and please check all that apply, a, improve the appearance of your calluses, cysts, nails, or other PC symptoms. B, decrease pain. C, increase either, is this the same problem? Check all that apply. So they're having the same problem with check all that apply. I'll go ahead and read the options so everyone can think about it, and hopefully we'll have this fixed in just a moment. So uh, C, increase either the length of time that you can walk or uh, improve your ability to do activities that involve being on your feet. D, reduce your need for use of mobility aids or alternative aids such as crawling, like we talked about in the last question. Or E, reduce the time required that you, uh, for you to manage your PC symptoms. Um, so this question is again, in the absence of a cure, what would be meaningful to you in treating your PC? And we'll let you know when it's ready. Okay, so go ahead now and exit out and come back into the app. And give me a thumbs up if it's working. Okay, should be good to go. So in the absence of a cure, what would be a meaningful treatment to you for your PC? Check all that apply. A, improving appearance. B, decreasing pain. C, increasing length of time that you can walk or improving your ability to do activities. Um, on your feet, D, reducing the need for AIDS, and E, reducing the time required to manage PC. Okay, give you another moment to respond to this question. Um, okay, so, um, since this is a check all that apply, again, the percentages are percentage of responses, not percentage of people. 
um, the uh, most selected um, uh, meaningful outcome or meaningful uh, treatment benefit for you, at, short of a cure, um, about uh, the highest one is decreasing pain. Um, next after that is increasing the length of time you can walk or improve your ability to, to do activities that involve being on your feet. Um, number three is, appears to be improving the appearance of the PC symptoms. Um, and then after that, uh, probably tied about and forth, is uh, redu reducing the need to use mobility aids um, and reducing the amount of time needed to care for your PC symptoms. All right, move on to the fifth question. So this question is, in the absence of a cure again, which single functional improvement would be most important to your quality of life? So here you're only going to select one. Do you want to A, reduce the time required to manage PC symptoms, B, increase either the length of time you can walk or improve your ability to do activities that involve being on your feet, or C, reduce your need to use mobility aids or alternative uh, aids, of, alternative forms of mobility such as crawling? Um, or D, something else, some other kind of functional improvement. All right, we'll give you just another moment to respond to which of these, absent a cure, would be the most important to your quality of life. Okay, so it looks like the overwhelming majority would like something that increases the length of time that they can walk or improve their ability to do activities on their feet. Um, however, there are uh, individuals that would like um, to see some kind of improvement on the, in the other uh, categories, as well as um, some that have something else that's not listed. So again, if you've selected one of those, uh, especially other, we would definitely like to hear what it is that you would like to see uh, to improve your quality of life when we go to the discussion. And lastly, if we can go to our sixth and final polling question. The question is, which of the following manifestations or symptoms of PC do you wish to see most improved by a treatment? So you can select from the following options. A, thickened nails. B, painful calluses and blisters on the soles of feet. C, painful calluses, blisters on your hands. D, the painful cysts. E, follicular hyperkeratosis, which are the little bumps on your waist, ar uh, legs, and arms, uh, or other. Uh, and then F, the leukokeratosis, which is the white growth on your tongue. So which of those would you wish to see most improved uh, by a treatment? Okay, just give you one more moment. Okay, so it looks like the uh, large majority uh, would like to see uh, the painful calluses and blisters on the soles of feet uh, improved by a treatment. Uh, after that, there's uh, over 10% of you that would like uh, to see improvement with the painful cysts. Um, there's some of you, a small number, that would like to, uh, would most want to see improvement in thickened nails or the painful calluses on your hands. Um, nobody selected follic uh, follicular hyperkeratosis or leukokeratosis. Okay, so we've made it through the polling. Um, thank you for bearing with us the, the technical difficulties, but I think it's important because it does give uh, you know, everybody an opportunity to weigh in on the range of things that we're uh, interested in exploring. Um, and now we're going to uh, explore those in more depth with you. Um, so let's take it back to the, the first part of these topic two questions, discussion questions, um, which relate to your current approaches to treatment. So, um, you know, it's what I heard from the panel and what I saw in the polling questions is that there's a lot of different things that you all in the PC community do to try to manage the symptoms and burdens of PC, um, ranging from, um, you know, uh, medical treatments, whether that be pain medicines or topical products, um, whether that be foot care, the pairing of calluses, the draining of blisters, um, you know, using alternative forms of mobility and, you know, other manage, you know, managing um, kind of your activities. Uh, we even heard about foot soaking. Uh, we heard 
Um, you know, so we heard a, a number of things, but what I want to hear from you in the audience is what really works best for you. And it could be a combination of things. It could be a single um, kind of approach to your, to your treatment. Um, but when you answer that question of what works best for you, I want to know why. Um, what is it that you get from that benefit? What is the benefit that you see that it, when you're telling me this gives you the most benefit? Because um, I, I want to kind of understand what you see as you know, kind of a treatment success. Um, and it might not be, again, full success. Not, we're not talking about cures here. Um, but you know, short of that cure, you know, what, are you, what kind of benefit are you getting from your best care? So would someone like to share with me what works best for you? Yep, if we can get a mic right here. And again, just also just a reminder, please say your name and what PC gene is affected um, when you speak. My name's Jamie and I have K17. Ibuprofen helps me better than any of the pain medications mm -hmm. that are prescribed. Um, however, I take 800 milligrams five times a day. Um, also, I smoke a lot of marijuana. Mm -hmm. I have smoked for 40 years. I don't think I would be here today if I had not. It just kind of takes my mind away from myself and out to deal with the world. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think as strongly about things after I smoke. I've smoked so long, I don't get high. But it does help to mentally keep me stabilized to make it through the day. Mm -hmm. Those are the only two things that I do other than the trimming and the hot bath soaks for the cyst. Mm -hmm. um, and then when I have the cyst, I do run a low-grade fever. Mm -hmm. So the ibuprofen also helps with that. But I have a lot of swelling, mm -hmm. water retention, swelling in my joints, aches and pains, a lot of uh, muscle aches and cramping. But I'm sure it's from being like this, mm -hmm. from all the pain all day, that makes my muscles do that. Mm -hmm. So that's and, what I do. And, and in terms of the, the kind of your, where you started, which was with you know, the ibuprofen mm -hmm. and the marijuana to help you know, somewhat disconnect, but also directly help with pain, it sounds like. Right. Um, you know, have you noticed, you know, as you've figured out what works for you, how do you know that this is you know, kind of your best current treatment regimen? I don't know that that's the best, mm -hmm. but that's the only way I've known to deal with it. Okay. I just found out in 2014 that it, what it was. Mm -hmm. So I've dealt my whole life self-treating myself. Mm -hmm. However, my daughter also has it, and she is one of the opioid mm -hmm. people that she just thinks she can't live without the mm -hmm. opioids and it really concerns me because I don't want it to go further um, but you never know what's on someone else's mind sure, sure. so it sounds like it's it's what you need to help you get through the day yeah yes thank you yeah okay looks like we have a comment on the far left side uh, my name is Jack Butler uh, I got the k-16 gene and uh, I guess for pain man management for me I do uh, shave my feet for the itching i soak them in bleach when i shower and then uh for pain medications i used to use ibuprofen until the doctor said i can't take that anymore so now i'm on uh, gabapentin meloxicam and tremadol and that seems to work the best for me and uh did you notice you know did you notice a change in your pain when you started these new products yeah it seemed to help the gabapentin helps it to, uh, not hurt as much right away in the morning mm -hmm. and kind of knocks the edge off everything throughout the whole day. Mm -hmm. And the Mox Cam is a lot better because I just take it once a day instead of multiple times throughout the day. Mm -hmm. And have you noticed any changes in what you're able to do um, in a given day because of the, the pain relief? Yeah, I can do more with it um, than I could with just like the ibuprofen. Mm -hmm. And it seems like I take a lot less. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Jack. Okay. We have Terry. 
Uh, I'm Terry Good, uh, K6A, and uh, after all my years of experience with PC, it comes down to uh, how I treat my feet mm -hmm. on a daily basis and daily activity. I've learned that hard, firm surfaces that I put the soles of my feet on to mm -hmm. are best for me because it minimizes the shearing action that occurs on your feet, particularly the sides of your feet, when you walk. If I can minimize the shearing uh, by having a hard landing pad for mm -hmm. my feet. Mm -hmm. Now on the feet themselves, I like thick hunter socks, mm -hmm. really thick socks. These are like that. Hard service with thick socks mm -hmm. really work well for me. And the thick socks, is that for cushioning or is that to keep your feet dry? The use of the, the thick hunter socks, is that so you have some cushioning? Is that to try to help with the, the moisture? And, and wide shoes so that there's not a whole lot I'm speaking of the mic for me. Wide shoes so there's not a whole lot of tightness on okay. the sides of the feet. Great. Thank you, Terry. Sorry. Nope, you're all good. Just want to make sure the people on the web can, can hear it, too. Okay. So we're, we're hearing a range of different strategies. Are there other strategies that um, you in the room have, have tried that haven't been talked about? We'll go here, and then we'll come up to Sarah. Okay, public speaking is my nightmare, so I apologize. Um, when, uh, especially the calluses on my heel get, uh, get dry and split, um, I've begun to use uh, Super glue to coat the entire callus. Um, I tried uh, Gorilla Glue and promptly glued a sock to my foot because uh, it wasn't quite dry. So that took about an hour to get off uh, at the end of the day. But the uh, if you if you coat the calluses in in a really fine uh, super glue or crazy glue and then sand it down, it, it it takes all those little tiny pieces of the callus and prevents them from hooking in the socks. Uh, when you pull your socks off and, and just kind of gives it a little bit of a protective coating. Um, it's, it's worked for me along with all the other things that, that I've heard here today. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, the Gorilla Glue guy who glued a sock to his foot. Uh, Richard Stedman, <laughs> K6C. Thank you. Okay, so we'll, we'll hear from Sarah and then, um, you know, and if there's, we'll take any other uh, additional strategies. Um, but then I want you to also start thinking about, um, we'll, we'll move to future treatments, and I'll have some questions about that. But go ahead, we'll go Sarah, and then we'll go over here. Hi, I'm Sarah, uh, K6A. I, um, <clears throat> desperate times call for desperate measures sometimes with our PC, and I found myself stuck uh, in the airport at uh, San Jose in California, and um, I found BioFreeze, which was a gel, it's topical. It got me through that day at the airport. It, it literally uh, instantly cooled my feet down and it was just a nice tingling sensation so that I could walk. The other thing I found was um, this adhesive and it's for something that you can put on, the, I haven't tried it yet, I'm waiting for summer, but it's something that you can put on the bottom of your feet when you're at the pool. It's a, it's a little uh, foam and um, it may be helpful, but um, I'm on Facebook, Sarah Delante, I'm, on, I'm in the PC group there, so if you want more info on it, just let me know and I'll, I'll shoot you the uh, link. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. All right, we'll, we'll take these two comments. Yes. Oh, okay. Um, Mary Howard, I have K16. Um, one of the things that has helped my feet feel better mm -hmm. is getting older. It's about the only thing that's nice about getting older. Um, going through menopause, they seem to have been better than when I was younger. Mm -hmm. And also, I've lost weight. I've changed my eating habits. Mm -hmm. I stopped sugar. I only eat anything that's fried. I've lost weight. And that, that made a big difference also. Um, the one foot I still have a lot of the fissures in it, mm -hmm. and I use mole skin on that to hold it together so I can walk okay. Mm -hmm. The other foot I have the problem with the itching, mm -hmm. 
So when I take stuff off at night, it itches so bad. I actually rub it on the side of the metal trim on my bed, mm. and I rub it to the point where it hurts so it itches so bad that I make it hurt even more. But mm. then it still itches like I can't get to it mm -hmm. to the point where I have tears in my eyes, but it's still itching. Mm. But wow. but getting old helped. Getting old helped. <laughs> well, and that's you know maybe that's good news for everybody in the room. Some some hope uh, for the future. I think we had a. I have a hand over here. Yep. Hi, my name is uh, Diane Spindell, and I have the uh, K6C uh, gene. Um, I try to stay as active as I can, um, and the only way I can do that is by wearing certain sneakers. Mm -hmm. They have to be running sneakers, even when I walk mm -hmm. um, or you know do house chores. Um, I have to wear the running sneakers. Mm -hmm. And I just have found, ironically, that um, I can't go bare feet, barefooted, but at the beach on the sand, I can. Hmm. I'm in, and I don't know, maybe my condition is different from everybody else in this room, but I found that I can walk a long distance pain-free on the sand at the beach. Hmm. And I could play beach volleyball wow. on the sand barefooted at the beach. Um, so I don't know what the deal is with that, um, but uh, in any case, I use the razor also to shave down mm -hmm. my calluses mm -hmm. and uh, needle to pop the blisters, but I have to have maintenance mm -hmm. of my feet daily in so order the, to be active. The, the daily maintenance, yeah. so that I think that's more frequent than maybe we've heard from others. Um, is it, you know, is there, it's just keeping up with it, or? Yeah, you know, even like taking, um, Foot baths, um, mm -hmm. I usually soak them in cold water, cold okay. icy water. Um, but if I can do it, and when I say daily, I, maybe every other day or mm -hmm. every one, every couple of days. Um, but if I do that, then I can be active to a mm -hmm. certain degree. But if I'm in the sand, mm -hmm. I, I can go wow. for a very long time pain free. Wow, I'm glad that you discovered that. So, yeah, that's great. Um, so now we, with our last couple minutes, just want to. Um, turn to the, to, to the future. Um, I think, so Smiley Riley mentioned that everything starts with the pain. Um, but, you know, um, we've heard a lot, you know, Jan and others talk about, um, you know, we, we, you manage your pain by managing your activities. Um, and that, you know, we heard in the first session uh, from Jason that you are powering through and doing activities despite the pain. Um, so it sounds like, you know, living with PC is quite complex, you know, there's this pain that's always there, whether you're doing activities or not, there's a, clearly, it sounds like, an impact on the activities that you can do, um, and, you know, lots of things that you have to, you know, not do because of your PC pain. So, uh, it's a complicated disease, um, and so this is a, a hard, going to be a hard question to answer, but, um, you know, I think maybe the polling questions, you know, gave you some ideas. But really, I want to know, um, you know, what specifically um, would you look for uh, that you don't get from your current treatment options from, you know, the next therapy that you would use? So, again, not a cure, but if there was one thing that you could get um, and, you know, let me know what that is and tell me why. So, you know, because going back to, to Smiley Riley, everything starts with the pain. Um, if, if your answer is, you know, for example, you want some relief from pain, tell me why that is. What would be the benefit that that would provide? If it's something else, um, you know, for example, one of the examples was um, less amount of time needed to care for yourself. Let me know why it is that you're choosing that. Um, but we'll take a few, you know, different responses to just get a feel for the room. Um, anybody want to weigh in on what they would look for specifically from a future treatment short of a cure? Uh, my name is Diane Butler, and I have 16, K16. Um, of course, we can't get a cure, but I would like less pain. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to walk on the grass or go to the airport, like even coming today, or, you know, to the airport and you have to take off your shoes. That was horrible. Mm -hmm. So I would just like to do, like, normal stuff, like, not wear shoes every single second mm. that I'm awake. Uh, no, 
Thank you. And we'll go to Holly and then Jason. Hi, Holly Jones, K6A. Mm -hmm. um, what I would like the most is for my feet to be totally numb. If the blisters are still there, if the calluses are still there, I can live with that because I've lived with it for 68 years. But if I could just have something to numb them, not necessarily numb my head with a, a, a drug that's going to do that, mm -hmm. um, but just some type, maybe a topical, just to numb the pain so that I wouldn't feel it. I could still have the condition, but I could um, cope a little bit better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. That's great. Jason? Hi, my name is Jason. I K6A, thank you. Uh, for me, it would be my feet sweat tremendously, and then it makes a callus soft, and then the calluses are like, then that's what really hurts. So I think for me, if if I could figure out a way to keep my feet, my feet dry, it'd mm -hmm. keep the calluses hard, and then it wouldn't be as, the pain would be as tremendous. Because right now, they get soft, and once they're soft, it's all over for me. Like right now, my feet are sweating, and I'm just sitting here, so. Mm -hmm. Uh, something to help with the sweating, and, and that would be yeah. probably a cure for me. So, yeah. no. thank you. No, thank you. That's great, Jim. Oh, one of the things I think it was Joy touched on earlier when she said she was laying down and she could almost feel her nails growing. And Jen and I had talked about it years ago, and we said how fast the nails grow. And I'm hearing today about everybody daily uh, trimming their calluses and popping blisters and said. Um, Possibly, I'm thinking if there's a way to slow the expression down even, if you can slow it down so it doesn't manifest as fast, that could possibly reduce the pain and the amount of treatment. Great. And any, we'll do one more thought. Oh, right here. My name is Selena Merriman, and I'm representing my daughter, Naomi Merriman. She's three, and she has the K-17 variation. Um, I would like to have some sort of treatment to improve her cysts and her um, follicular hyperkeratosis. Um, it may be because of her age. She doesn't have a lot of problem with callusing or pain on her feet. But the skin problems are very much a risk of infection. Mm -hmm. um, they are painful for her um, as those, um, the hyperkeratosis gets worse. Um, she doesn't like for them to be touched. She doesn't like for her clothes to touch them. Um, we sometimes have to put bleach in her bath water to fight infection. And there are probably 50 different lotions and creams that we have tried to just improve um, the cysts and the, the bumps. Um, some of them she doesn't tolerate well at all. Um, some of them maybe help some. Um, we're using one made by Vaseline right now and, and it's improved it by making them less red and softer. Um, so that makes them less painful. Um, but there is definitely not anything that fixes this problem. And that's, that's my biggest concern for her right now. Okay. Thank you. I know I said last one, but there's a voice that we haven't heard yet today, and he raised his hand. So we'll give you the last word. Hi, my name is Justin Rokiski, and I have K17. So a treatment that I would hope for the future is one that would reduce the likelihood of inflamed cysts. And there are times that I've had several of these in just the most inconvenient locations on your body that you are forced to accommodate how you sit, how you sleep, how you lay down, how you walk. So it's not only do we have to cope with the addition of the callousing on your feet when you're walking with those as well, but then you have to think about how you're just sitting there or how you're sleeping. And um, I think what's most frustrating about that is that you never know where the next inflammation will be. So it's like, you're constantly forced to be accommodating, like just on the daily of how you're doing anything. So I think that something that would reduce the likelihood that they are going to become inflamed. And also when they do come inflamed, as she mentioned before, there's a risk of infection, which I've had myself too. I've had MRSA as a result of the cyst. And so that's literally crippled me to the point where I was crawling on the floor with that infection. Mm -hmm. So it's just, I think it's really important to want to target the inflammation so that we can prevent that whole like, you know, progression to infections like that. Yeah, thank you very much. So, you know, I think I was, I think I was right to say that PC is 
complex and just from the range of things that we heard that you all would want from a future treatment, um, I think reflects that. Um, so this concludes the uh, patient engagement portion of our uh, program. So, uh, you know, as we move to our summary remarks um, and then lunch, uh, before we do that, I just want to thank you all for um, your openness and allowing me to ask you very personal and hard questions. Uh, it's been a very great honor to get to work with PC Project, um, with the panelists, and now you today, the audience. Um, so thank you for, for doing that and being so open um, and trusting, and I know, I think we're gonna hear um, uh, very shortly, you know, um, uh, uh, that what you had to say was, you know, exactly what we needed to hear to really understand um, PC and the experiences that you have in your daily life. Um, so thank you for giving me that opportunity. And now I'd like to introduce our um, FDA official who's giving our summary remarks for the PC session, which is Dr. Jill Lindstrom. Uh, Dr. Lindstrom is the Deputy Director of the Division of, Division of Dermatology and Dental Drug Products at FDA, and she's a board certified dermatologist. In this role at FDA, she works with companies and researchers that are navigating uh, the development of safe and effective products for conditions like PC. And ultimately, uh, Dr. Lindstrom helps determine if the benefits of these new drugs outweigh the risks uh, and can be FDA approved. Prior to joining FDA in 2002, she served eight years in the Army and six years in private practice in Washington, D.C. She's a graduate of Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine and completed her internship and dermatology residency at Walter Reed Army Medical Center. Jill. Thank you. It's my privilege and challenge to summarize this um, impactive and I think profound morning session. Before I attempt to do so, I'd like to thank a few organizations and individuals. I want to thank the PC Project for bringing together this session. I want to thank James for his expert moderation, his, and I want to thank him and Frank Sasanowski for their preparation um, with PC Project to bring the session together. And I'd like to thank Dr. Bites for setting the regulatory framework, bringing forward that we at FDA have a legislative mandate to hear and incorporate the patient voice. I want to thank Dr. Bruckner for laying an excellent clinical foundation for today's discussion. But most of all, I want to thank the patients and the caregivers, each of you on the panel sessions and in the audience and also on the web, although we didn't hear from them directly. I want to thank you. I want to deeply and profoundly thank you um, for coming today, for giving so generously of your time, for your courage, your transparency, your dignity as you shared your stories, for your courage and your dignity as you've confronted your disease and lived your lives in, um, in the face of the challenges that your diagnoses have presented to you. What you've said today has been impactive and profound, and I think it's going to be extraordinarily useful to me and my colleagues at FDA, but also to academicians and to pharmaceutical companies and others who, whether they participated today here or on the web, or will read the voice of the patient report that will come out from it, I think that they will find um, much to mine from that. So thank you very much. In attempting to summarize um, this morning's session, I want to acknowledge that I cannot do justice to that, to the eloquence and breadth of your comments, but I want to attempt to highlight a few themes that I heard, and in my inadequacy in summarizing the session, I want you to take comfort in that there will be a report that will come out that will doubtless do a better job than I am able to do today. But one theme that I heard strongly was that of pain. The pain that you feel, I wrote down that 
I wrote down and now I can't find it, but I believe it was 95% of you experienced pain with every step. 94% rated your pain as moderate, severe, or unbearable. That, that is profound to me. There's not only the primary pain that you experience from the calluses, but then there's the secondary pain from the limitation in your lives that, 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 that results from that pain, the limitation in your activities, the depression, the bullying that people described experiencing or observing um, their children experience. In my role as a physician, scientist, regulator, I often work from a certain um, uh, scientific or intellectual, a position of intellectual detachment as I'm engaging with data numbers. But you have not afforded me that luxury today, beginning with the first uh, person on the morning panel, Mr. Padovano, who spoke of a bank account, a limited bank account of steps. I, I couldn't be detached anymore suddenly. It was real flesh, it's not just numbers. Um, a limitation of steps, a limited bank account. And then the remaining panelists who spoke either of their children or of their future children. I um, am not ashamed to say you moved me to tears. I wept at your stories. They were um, profound. and. I thank you very much for sharing them. I want you to know that while you um, described that your pain is often invisible pain, it was not invisible today. I am sure I don't fully understand it, but I heard it and I felt it. And I know that my colleagues did as well. And I think, again, it will be impactive to us as I listened to the second session and the, the um, therapies that people tried and are trying and are using, a theme, uh, something that I did not hear much of, um, was effective um, pharmaceutical approaches. Yes, pain medication, but not direct therapeutic approaches, some in development. And I think the challenge for myself, my clinician colleagues, my colleagues in the pharmaceutical industry is to change that trajectory. And um, an outcome, I think, of today's session is that we now have information from you on, that can help us with creative approaches to endpoints as scientists and pharmaceutical, develop, uh, pharmaceutical companies seek to develop agents to treat Pachynichia congenita. So in summary, I heard from courageous and dignified individuals suffering from Pachynichia congenita that this very serious condition causes pain and limitation in mobility and other, um, other impacts on your lives. And again, I want to thank you for sharing with us your voice, your experience, and um, doing so in such a courageous and dignified manner. Thank you so much, Dr. Lindstrom, and um, yeah, I think you know that is going to take us a long way in our journey, uh, PC Project's journey of trying to summarize this session. Um, and so, thank you for those very insightful and thoughtful remarks. Um, so, thank you all. Uh, we have now uh, concluded the full PC session, um, and we have lunch next door. Um, we invite you back to participate in the EB session in the afternoon. Um, and look forward uh, to seeing you after, after the lunch break. So thank you. <laughs>